Welcome to the Blade Fit Today podcast, where we discuss the lively world of historical fencing and everything else related to the sword arts around the globe. Today's guest is Jim Epperly. Jim is a martial arts instructor from Kennewick, Washington. He has trained in various martial arts over the years and is currently an instructor for Blackbird Training Group, teaching the Filipino martial art of Kali and the lead instructor of Black Feather Broadsword Academy, teaching HEMA, specifically Scottish Basket Hilted Broadsword, and English Military Saber. Aside from teaching, fighting, or practicing, he's a dad, a surgical first assistant, and a self-described RPG nerd. <laughs> Absolutely. Jim, Jim, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you, sir. Good to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Uh Hey, well, we we were talking off camera, and uh, yeah, it was is a good convo. So uh, let, might let's as well get into it. push record and get going. Yeah, let's let's push record. <laughs> oh, I should push record. No, you already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, shoot. Um, yeah, how's your day been? It's been great. It's a nice day. Kind of uh, uh, the interesting thing about my job is. Uh, so I, I assist surgeons in surgery for various things. I'll, I'll, I did plastic surgery in the morning, and then I did orthopedics in the in oh, the wow. late late morning and afternoon. So it's kind of fun. You get to do various things. You're not. It's one of the favorite parts of the job. Is I'm not like stuck doing one thing all the time. Yeah. I have certain surgeons that I work with more than others, okay. but um, uh, it's it's a cool job in that in one in any given week you kind of see all these different things and and whatnot so never bored never yeah, bored that... you don't want to be too excited because <laughs> <laughs> if we're excited somebody's having a horrible day but oh man but at the same time uh it's always it's cool to have a variety as a spice of life right yeah yeah exactly well that's good though um uh <laughs> boredom in your day-to-day job oh, it's just oh, tedium I... it's so stupid yeah Yes, yeah, stupid. That's a great word for it, and I feel sorry for for you know people who do have a job like that. Yeah, um, I'm kind of lucky because uh, I do you know custom work. Everything's, I mean, people are people, but everything is just a little bit different. What I do, I'm in the dental industry, so. Oh, right on. Yeah, everything's little, teeny, tiny. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, and it's all unique. So when I was fit. first, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> nah, I was just gonna say it won't fit. You know, when I make something for one person, it fits them and them only, and that's it. Yeah. So. When I was first uh, an operating room nurse, I worked a lot with uh, Peds Dental Group. They would bring kids in. They'd give them general anesthesia, like lower socioeconomic kids. Mm-hmm. They would give them general anesthesia, and they would, like, put caps in their whole mouth. Like, oh, we would wow. do, it, you know, they'd be, like, four or five years old and um, economically disadvantaged and all that kind of stuff. And then their, their teeth would just be horrible. And yeah. so these doctors would come in, bring them in and, and do general anesthesia, get them all the way asleep. Then they could do their whole mouth and um, really change these kids' lives because they, they would have mouth pain and all this kind of stuff. And sure, it might hurt for a couple hours afterwards. So, you know, we give them medications and stuff to make them more comfortable. But mm-hmm. after that, they had, you know, a mouthful of caps for years until they got older and stuff. So. Yeah, that's good. That's that's definitely good. it's it's amazing what it like your your smile it it just changes a person. Um, Absolutely, seen that lots and lots of times. So anyway, <laughs> you, <laughs> you're in the medical, medical profession. Training. I yeah. do dental, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's nice uh, having an occupation where you you actually help people. So yeah, good. really changing people's lives is pretty cool. We build them up, and then we at night we teach them and tear them down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's one of my ideas for. Uh, I want to get a tattoo here pretty soon, okay. and I, I want it. It's literally going to be the dichotomy of my life, and I want it to have a scalpel on one side, and I have have it say "Do no harm," uh, and I want it to have a dagger on the other side, and says "Do K N O W harm." <laughs> so do no harm, do no harm, but you know. Yeah literally the dichotomy of <laughs> i like it that, of me funny. you know it's pretty yeah. inter- it's, it's kind of interesting but yeah dichotomies man uh mm-hmm. well you just reminded me of, of something anyway well let's uh let's uh first question <laughs> is <laughs> um about about journeys so we were talking yeah. before off camera a little bit about journeys and mm-hmm. um 
So I'm just going to quote you on, the, on this first question here. He says, one of your favorite topics, um, how everyone has their own personal journey in the martial arts and how this both drives them and at times separates them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so let, let's talk about that. So any, anyone with a little bit of this, uh, whether it be like in their hair a little bit or, or down here on the old beard, the, uh, the, the old 70s uh, chop sake kung fu theater stuff, you know, oh, whose yeah. kung fu is best, you know, that that wasn't just this goofy thing kind of dreamed up for uh, for cinema. You know, like if, if you've spent any time on any martial arts forum online, at some point, somebody's going to be throwing shade on somebody else's martial art. Yeah. And like the reality is, I don't know you, bro. You don't know me. You know, I, 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 I watched a um, presentation by a Aikido club uh, a couple weekends ago. Mm hmm. And everybody on the on the panel was uh, from this Aikido club, and they were talking about how um, they uh, what what their journey was and and how they came upon it and all this kind of stuff. And the reason why I was there is our club was giving a demo uh, immediately after theirs, and so I had a few of my guys there, and um, <clears throat> they were talking about uh, most of them were talking about how they really liked Aikido and you used your opponent's energy against them. And they liked that they could handle themselves without having to hurt somebody and, you know, all this kinds of stuff. And I'm basically sitting in the front row with three chained dogs that, that just kind of look like people <laughs> because <laughs> my guys are dyed in the wool FMA stick fighters and they'll fight anybody like, bring it you know like yeah. you have to we we teach we literally tell people that your goal in our in our club should be to have a dial and not a switch right like you shouldn't you yeah. shouldn't have a, a sparring switch and a no sparring switch you should be able to spar with a six-year-old and turn it down to one like and that. you should be able to spar with a guy from dog brothers and turn it up to 11 and bang right like you right. should be able to you should be able to go you should be able to be willing to fight anybody and it, that's just like in the, in the filipino martial arts community and, and specifically our club our club is known as a sparring heavy club mm -hmm. like that's that's what we do and so the the guys next to me were kind of like uh this isn't interesting <laughs> you know that they, they they just they're the place where they're at in their journey is very much not align in alignment with this uh, Aikido school. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of funny is my my black belt, uh, my first black belt is in uh, Aiki Jiu Jitsu, which is Aikido adjacent. It's it's older. Okay. It's an, it's an older uh, martial art, traditional um, Japanese style martial art than Aikido. Pretty much, literally, partially where Aikido comes from. Okay. Well. Sorry, I'm, Be, I'm, I'm adjusting my mic. Go ahead. Oh, you're, I, I'm, you're, I'm totally listening to you. <laughs> you're fine. It's one of the things about um, like where I'm at in my martial arts journey is I try and be like actively try and be a little bit more contemplative and be like, well, you know, what's this person going through? Like as an instructor, I'm trying to see, you know, this guy needs more direction here or this person, uh, she needs this or, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, where is this person at? What are they looking for? And, and just trying to be, I don't want to say like nurturing because that sounds soft, I guess, but just trying yeah. to see what people need. Like that's that's the service that we're trying to provide as instructors while at the same time encouraging them, them to hit other people hard. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like that, that kind of boring, again, a dichotomy. Right. But um, as, I've, as I've realized I'm older and more introspective and, and thinking about things, I realize that those people have a, a valid, that's their journey, right? Like their whole thing is to not hurt people. And it's to, um, uh, they want to feel comfortable in their skin or it, it empowers right. them. It makes them feel powerful. Or maybe it's a social thing. They like go into this club where you feel a sense of community and, and you're sharing the, the, the martial arts journey and, you're feeling included and accepted and stuff. Everybody gets something else, something different from their martial art that they choose. 
And whenever anybody asks me what martial arts should I do, I kind of first kind of see where they're at. Like, what do they need it for? Yeah. And then I kind of try and gauge their personality. Like, what are they, what do they need it for? But what are they looking for? Mm-hmm. You know, if they're, um, if they need a sort of self defense kind of thing, I'll, I'll try and like, we have a self-defense class that I run on Wednesdays and that's, that's more self-defense than martial arts. And there's a huge difference between the two because, you know, I never learned a single thing about situational awareness necessarily in my martial arts class, unless it was talking to people after class mm-hmm. and situational mm-hmm. awareness is probably the bigger 95% of self-defense. Right. You know? And so maybe sometimes it's just somebody that wants to get in shape and they want to do something active. Well, that's a different kind of class sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. the, maybe they don't, one of the things about Filipino martial arts stuff is you kind of have to have a tolerance for getting hit. Like that's, you know, the, the, the idea when you spar in, in FMA kind of stuff is in general, I should say, I, this is just speaking more, more for our club and the, some of the things, the events that we're affiliated with, but you enter into an agreement with your opponent and part of that agreement, the most important part of that agreement is to be friends at the end of the match. Right. So, yeah, I like that a lot, actually. Yeah, I, I'm going to hit you and you try and hit me. And I, I pretty much promise that I'm not going to hit you as hard as I can. You know, because that that's just there's something wrong with that. I think if you go into the thing. Yeah, that's weird and cruel. Right. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not going to hold back a ton unless you we agree to. Like, you know, hey, uh, Nate, you want to go light and just like kind of technical? And you're like, yeah. yeah, my knees have kind of been bugging me. Cool, let's go, <laughs> right? Or the, the older you get, the more these kind of conversations you have to have before every sparring match. One hundred percent, you start adding to the, the the bullet point list of of what you can't do. You know? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I just had no, no. It's one hundred percent. I'm I'm actually dealing with a shoulder injury. Ironically, I've been I've been trying to work out a whole bunch more uh, in the mornings, and I I tweak my shoulder. Um that I hadn't had issues with in years. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, that's kind of, it's kind of crummy. And and now I'm like, yeah. I can't like when I'm instructing, I have to be careful and not go to just, it's been the, just the past couple of days and I can't go too much like swing and stuff because that just aggravates it and inflames it. Mm, yeah. And so I'm, I need a couple, you know, four or five days. I'm going to really ice it this weekend and kind of take care of it. But yeah. you know, with, with gray hair comes gray responsibility. You have to, <laughs> you have to really take care of yourself. Yeah. But, but kind of back to what we were talking about, like that agreement between two people Mm -hmm. say, maybe you're, you're queuing up for you. You're going to go to the dog brothers in LA in a month. And you're like, no man, let's go. Let's like, let's really turn it up and, and like see where this thing takes us and grappling's fine. Uh, backup weapons are fine. You know, just don't hit me on the top of my foot. (laughs) Yeah. No, those shots, they're the worst. But, but, you know, like stuff like that, you know, and, and the cool. And then you go out there and you bang and you hit, you hit each other. And at the end you have a big hug and you're like, oh man, that was so great. And, and to me and to, to our club, for the most part, the adrenaline dump that you get when somebody else is trying to hit you with a, with a rattan stick is pretty real. Like it's, it's really stresses you out and it, and it yeah. for, forces you to focus and all the things. But at the same time, to have a dial, right. And not a switch. So you can kind of, maybe you, you say that you're like, Hey, I'm going to dog brothers. Let's go. And I get out there and 30 seconds in, I am tearing you apart. I'm going to turn it way down. Like I know what you're looking for. Right. And I, and I know what I'm trying to give you because I've, I've been to a dog brothers match, but like at the same time I have to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for. I have to be observant enough that I can see that that's not where you're at. And so I don't right. want to tear you apart for two more minutes. I'm going to be, I'm going to back off a little bit and just, and now I'm going to play a technical game maybe. And yeah, you know, right. not, not be, not to be insulting to the guy that I'm fighting, but, but to more like be cognizant of, of a, of a, a disparity in ability. Right. Different things it, like that, yeah. you know, and it's not that, uh, um, um, what I mean by it's not that I, I mean the, the disrespect part, right? Like, um, if yeah. something is just a total 
overmatch, right? No one's there for an overmatch. I mean, not yeah. if this is kind of your lifestyle. And so, uh, yeah, and some people might dis, uh, might interpret that as, uh, you know, dishonor if you're, if you're changing it up a little bit. But uh, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm going around and around in my head about that. But, yeah, no, being, having that ability to see somebody and dial it down and have that experience and, Perhaps maybe your intensity is the same, but mm-hmm. your targets that you're going for is different or, you know, you just play the game a little bit differently so they can enjoy it. You can enjoy it. You're pushing yourself in a different way. Right. You know, maybe you're looking for openings and then you don't take it because you're waiting for the second opening. I mean, there's all kinds of weird yeah. things that you can do, right, where you're still challenging yourself and, and they're, you know, they'll 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 continue on their journey like Right. It's hard to it's it's hard to just get totally decimated, demolished, mm. and then feel good about well yeah practices next Monday I'm gonna go right you know? exactly they, they don't come back a lot of nine well I don't want to say nine times out of ten but a lot of times they just don't come back yeah I I 100% agree with you and so like that whole thing of you know um, the the camaraderie and the and the the fighting to the other person's level and stuff like that. You know, when I the very when I when I did go to Dog Brothers, I was really concerned uh, about what it was going to be like because my personal focus is well. Back up for a second. So the the specific uh, Filipino martial art that I do is called Pakiti Tercia Kali, and it's uh, loosely translated to close quarters uh, combat, and it's a it's a knife and sword art first. But they also teach uh, impact weapons, stick, and okay. empty hand, right? Mm-hmm. Pretty much literally, and spear a little bit also. So pretty much okay. literally anything anything that has a ability to hurt somebody. We anything you need to there. ambush somebody in the jungle, is that it? <laughs> well, the, the pretty much literally. So <laughs> as, as I understand it, the history of Pekiti Tercia, like how it got to be relatively uh, big or important was... Um, in the south philippines the uh, insurgents were attacking and ambushing uh, philippine military and they weren't particularly rich but they had everybody had there has some sort of bolo or sword mm-hmm. uh, short sword machete kind of thing and they would jump out of the jungle chop these guys up and then fade back into the jungle kind of via kong style yeah well <clears throat> this one particular marine force recon unit was led by a guy that had some pakiti tercia training and he was teaching his guys how to run swords and knives. And, nice. and um, when he, his men started getting out in the field and when they would get ambushed and these, these guys were able to fight back, attacks against them diminished. Yeah. So the Filipino military decided, that's a great idea. <laughs> so they started <laughs> mess teaching, with this unit. Right. So they started teaching yeah. all their military units that stuff. So our, our particular... Fantastic. Yeah. Our particular kind of uh, Kali is, um, it's sort of bizarre because when it first came to the States in the, I want to say the 80s or like late 80s, something like that. Mm-hmm. I'm not the best Pekiti Tercia historian, incidentally. But when it came to the States at first, um, it was very much at the time, all the karate was a big thing. Mm-hmm. And so it was a big art. And he, the uh, Grand Tuhan, Leo Gahe, was teaching this art and it, to people, but he had to teach it not like he learned it, but more like people that already were learning karate would learn it. Okay. Well, then when it, when the Filipino military started learning it, they had to learn this condensed version that you could get in boot camp. Hmm. So he basically got out the pruning shears and trimmed this down to this super fast, uh, accessible art. They, like, basically, we need to make you a problem to somebody else with a sword in three months. And I think he did that. He, he really pruned it down. Somebody that comes to our school for three or four months is if, if somebody's kind of skilled with the blade, somebody that comes out of our school in three or four months is going to be kind of a problem. N- not, not to somebody that's much more skilled. They're not, it's not true, but it's, it's rapidly acquirable. I think. Right. Which, uh, which is pretty, great. pretty, pretty interesting if you think about it. So, looking at the weird intersections between the two arts that I currently teach, <laughs> you think about the Scottish broadsword and the British military saber. That's what they're doing too. 
they're taking these kids that, uh, you know, the, the nobles already had their own education in, mm -hmm. in fencing generally, even though it was generally small sword or, or uh, more thrust kind of centric stuff. But they're taking these people that had relatively little uh, fencing skills and they do like traditional hard style karate. They stick everybody in lines and they go one, two, <laughs> three, four, right? Like they're going through the thing by the numbers, lads. And yeah, right. They had to get these guys somewhat competent to fight in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's sort of iconic to Scottish broadsword fencing is the idea of every time you do a defense, you slip your you slip your lead leg back. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, yeah. So so part of that I think is artifact because you have these people that have very little sword fighting experience, mm -hmm. and if they only have to think if their decision tree is a decision stick. And there's no if thens that they have to think about. Every time I defend, I pull my leg back. I don't have to worry about the guys doing a drift shot down to my leg. Right. That front leg is protected every single time. Yeah. So so there you go. There's that that blade art that's intentionally designed to be rapidly acquirable. Is yeah. is the stuff you get from Taylor or um, well McBain's kind of cheating, but. Taylor or uh, some of these guys like, like is it an or... expansive saber uh, manual? Well, not really, but it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to get people lethal with the sword. Mm -hmm. the 133 or, or I-33, however they say it this yeah. year. Um, <laughs> that true. is that is like, and if you want more advanced stuff, you should go seek it out, right? There's all these kind of caveats to if it's written down, it's, it's probably kind of basic stuff. And then all the really amazing stuff, you know, I mean, I guess some of the, some of the other European stuff like, um, I, and I'm, I'm a hundred percent not, not fluent with any of these, but like Fiore or, um, uh, uh, any of the, any of the German type stuff, like very expansive and they go mm -hmm. through like six or seven weapon systems and they have yeah. all these different things like, that's not what the English military a saber or the Scottish broadsword stuff is. It's not at all that. This yeah, is for definitely not. I agree with you on that. This is for a, a professional army to get competent in a short amount of time. Yeah, and and for me, that's the beauty of it. I mean, I think you're speaking my language. I, I'm a pretty pragmatic guy, um, mm -hmm. practical, and you know, there's something to be said for. I almost see them as embellishments. I mean, <clears throat> they are. Um, you know, when you're talking, you know, high level rapier, or high level long sword or, or high level, um, even, you know, some of the Balinese stuff, it's, it's, it's relevant. It's interesting. It's a, it's a great discipline. Um, but I'm a bread and butter guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if you, and I'm willing to bet, and I know a lot of people get very upset at me, but I just have not, haven't been proven wrong yet. I don't think. Nine times out of ten, if you execute that bread and butter the way that you're supposed to in the time and place, you're as effective, if not more effective. What's that saying? Uh, or that that kind of a oh man, it's kind of a jokey thing. The 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 student watches his master fight like ten guys, and he only uses one kick. And he says, "Master, why did you only use that one kick?" And he says, "It's the only one I needed." Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, and that kind of goes back to the to the um, what your journey is. Right. Mm -hmm. My personal journey, I started off um, watching those old chop sake flicks, uh, playing, -sake. playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or uh, ninjas and super spies role playing games. Right. And all mm -hmm. these cool martial arts and and Bruce Lee. And it was a big deal and all this stuff. And you're just like, oh, man, it's so great. And then. Um, I was lucky enough in high school to find uh, the the United States uh, best free martial arts program in wrestling. Mm, okay. And so I wrestled in high school, yeah. and then after I got in, out of high school, um, unless you're outstanding, that's your last wrestling you're ever going to do in your whole life. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know. And, and so I was like, well, what now? My brother and I found a guy teaching uh, uh, Shing Yi Kung Fu, literally for the community center. And so we met in the park for like three months or something like that, learning this pretty esoteric energy focused style of Kung Fu, which was great. 
but it wasn't kind of what we were looking for. And then uh, not long after that, we found a, a, a judo school in, in Richland. Mm -hmm. And then that judo school taught Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we went there and they're, they look at these two of us, both of us were like big stocky guys, you know, about 220 pounds. And I was 25. I think my brother was 21 or so. Okay. And uh, they're like, you two should do the Aiki Jiu Jitsu class. That would be awesome. And so Monday was that class. So we were going to the martial arts stuff three days a week and learning throws and takedowns and chokes and all that kind of stuff and all this good grappling game and takedowns. And we both wrestled. So that re went right in with the judo and oh, yeah. we were having a, we were having a great time. And, um, it's just kind of one thing and another life happened a little bit. We got a little bit away from it. Um, I ultimately, I think I had a, uh, I ended up with a brown belt in judo and then, uh, Aiki Jiu Jitsu. I, I had continued on a little bit further than that and I got my black belt in that. And then I was like, not sure what I wanted to do. Like, again, like we had talked uh, before we started recording, um, that particular school was really great and giving you a, a breadth and depth of exposure. We had like six different uh, black belts that, that taught the class and literally each one of them had a black belt in something else plus what we were teaching. Mm -hmm. So depending on who was leading the class, you got a little different flavor by each student or each instructor. And that was great. It was a really cool way to learn, but it didn't teach you how to teach because each one taught differently, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was like, man, if I hung my own shingle and tried to teach, because that's the whole thing of being a black belt, you're supposed to be able to teach now. Right. I couldn't teach. Like I, I helped out with like the beginners classes and stuff. But, you know, aside from that, I, I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. And um, at some point in there, we had a Filipino martial arts seminar with a, a guy that's pretty experienced in the area named James Keating. Amazing, amazing martial artist. Like, uh, easily top three of my scariest humans I've ever met list. Um, wow. Just a super, super competent guy, but like super nice, like just a, a great guy. And that was a, my exposure to the Filipino martial arts. And then like three or four years later, I was looking for a, a guitar teacher for my son in, on Craigslist. And I happened to see an advertisement for Lamont's uh, Blackbird training group school. Yeah. I was, I was like, Oh my God, there's a Filipino martial arts school in the Tri-Cities? Because I had no idea. I hadn't really been looking, to be honest, but mm -hmm. this was like the first time it was like in my face. And so I go, I go there, and like the ink was still wet on my paper that said black belt in my other school, right? Like <laughs> it was literally like a few months later. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I go to Lamont school. And one of the first things he tells me, I'll never ever forget because it's a, the perfect contrast to my other school. He said, you know, in this, in this school, we teach that everybody that you fight is better than you. They're faster and stronger than you probably. And they probably have a weapon. And if they have a weapon, they probably have an extra weapon. <laughs> right? Like that's, that's yeah. who you're fighting with every, every encounter. And when, um, in my old school, every three or four months, you'd be grappling with somebody and somebody would throw a, a crappy century rubber training knife on the floor. And that was your exposure to knife fighting, right? Mm -hmm. And they would show you some really goofy, never going to happen in real life wrist locks. The wrist locks are great, but you're never going to pull it off on, a, on an active, like a, a hard uh, uh, coming at you knife fighter. Yeah. And I was like, I thought I could hang in a knife fight or like in some sort of combative situation but I, I really probably am only conversing in about half of what the fight could be if there's a weapon involved at all i'm i'm in trouble and to have that be the first thing that lamont kind of encouraged you to recognize is that we're going to assume that everything's really horrible and uh, a, a, i can't remember where i got it but i what i use now when i tell people this story is i say if it's a drunkle a drunk uncle at a, at a family reunion, you don't want to destroy the guy, right? You want to like maybe take him down or whatever. Yeah. And again, you have to have a dial. You, you can't just like those, those, all those uh, internet warriors that are like, yeah, when I, when I go uh, get into a fight, I just see red. 
right? <laughs> like I can't practice my techniques because I'll hurt somebody. Well, uh, yeah, that's not, okay, that's buddy. Not, exactly. That's not real life. Like people don't work like that. And no. so if you do work like that, you're not accustomed to the experience and you can't control your adrenaline. Exactly. I mean, how do you tell how do you tell someone who doesn't practice much with someone who does and, and it's someone who says something like that? Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's just yeah, you just physiologically things happen. And I think that's what's really cool about martial arts. You learn things about yourself that you just can't learn in any other um, type of situation. And, you know, if if you're if you're getting tunnel vision, if you're mm -hmm. seeing red, dude, you just need to do it more because uh, you're locking up. That's bad. That's like, overload. do you remember your do you remember the first time you ever sparred? Yeah, like scary. like at a high like at a high level. Trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, it was um, uh, actually it was in. <laughs> Okay, this might sound pretentious. I was in Belarus at the time. <laughs> so I, I, I went for this tournament, right? So I, I got, um, you know, certified to, to, uh, to, to teach. This, this particular is called Modern Sword Fighting, so I went there. Um, yeah, this was in Poland. So I practiced, and I, you know, I fought, and I was teaching other people. And, you know, they're all brand new, and, and I was uh, kind of newer on my journey, but I had, I had done a lot of just maniacal solo drills forever and ever, mm -hmm. and ever. And um, so they had their, their world uh, attorney and it was in Belarus. And so I went and it was really the first time that I was at a, a higher level sparring uh -huh. and man, my, my fingertips were just tingly. My mm -hmm. knees were, tr I was trying to look tough. I was trying to not have my and knees you, knock. You like yeah. the, the tunnel vision and it yeah. sounds like everybody's like 20 feet away. Yeah. Yeah. All classic adrenaline, uh, adrenaline response stuff. Yeah, and yeah. what's great about tournaments is you kind of get a, that little tingle. But you know, w when you've done it a lot, it's it's uh, you kind of become a junkie. You sort of like it. You're like, yeah, let's do a this. little bit. Yeah. yeah. I, what I've noticed for me is between what I do for a living and what I do for a hobby, uh -huh. at their most intense, neither one is super relaxing. Mm. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. we had, uh, we had an incident at, uh, a Ren fair that we were doing a demo at and somebody was injured pretty severely and I was helping take care of that person. Ooh. And <clears throat> we were waiting for the, we were waiting for the paramedics to get there and I was helping coordinate care and there was a firefighter there and a, and an EMT guy and another nurse. So there was four of us, you know, experienced healthcare people taking care of them. Uh, I'll never forget it. This guy showed up and he, he says, do you need medical gear? And we're like, there's four people and I'm, I'm in a kilt and like a pirates of Penzance shirt. Right. <laughs> like like the, the other people are, you know, I think one of the other guys was dressed up and the other two are just uh, c civilians around in the, in the, um, in the Ren fair, you know? Yeah. And, and we're like, we, we have nothing like we didn't have gloves on. And, and that person that we were dealing with was bleeding and, and whatever. And uh, he's like, I'll be right back. And he brings back this full, like military medical trauma bag. And he's like, I don't know how to use any of it, but you can use whatever you need. And I was like, thank you. I, <laughs> you know, so I'm handing out stuff to people and, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of coordinating stuff and whatever. And uh, the fire department gets there and we, we do our handoff. We tell them what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And then <clears throat> I, I think I, they gave, somebody gave me a towel and I like cleaned my hands off and I was walking back to the, I was walking back to the uh, tent where our thing was and my hands just started to shake and I started to sweat a whole bunch. Yeah. And th then I got the adrenaline dump like afterwards. Yeah. As, 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 and and I, I thought was thinking about it and I was like, that's, kind of interesting like I've, i don't think i've had that happen at work but this is probably like my first big medical thing that ever happened outside of the hyper fastidiously controlled thing of an operating room mm -hmm. but between that and the kind of i know and i know some people don't really believe in it but i've heard a term called stress inoculation <clears throat> so where you you're under stress enough and you're under adrenaline dump adrenaline dump kind of stuff enough that it doesn't quite affect you as bad as it as it would in some things in other in other situations like you end up being able to handle it generally 
And I, I don't know if it was that or what, but yeah, that it was so significant afterwards was very, you know, very interesting to me. And like after that first sparring, you were talking about the the tunnel vision, yeah. and the hearing, and all that stuff. The, my very first stick fight with real boy Rattan, that's a hundred percent what I had. I was terrified what that was <laughs> going to feel like, and now now i'm analyzing the person that i'm fighting especially if it's at school and mm -hmm. i'm thinking like what does this person need to work on or you know if it's one of my higher level guys now i'm thinking what do i want to work on you know like I, i'm not just trying to survive i'm just trying to be like uh let's be creative here let's uh um we call it a redondo a moulin a mm -hmm. so that was one of the things that i was trying to pull off if if i'm if i'm fighting a, a person that i just I'm very much skilled at, I constrain my own sparring to higher level techniques that I know I can't pull off. Yeah. So oh, like if cool. they're, if they're throwing a one, I'll try and moulin a the one and then hit their arm. Mm. Or, uh, like if we have like a back, a back moulin a for a, uh, a, a back redondo for like, if they're swinging a two and my, my, my weapons cross loaded, I'll yeah. try and I'll try and catch it with the back of the weapon and then bring that a, across to attack and stuff. So I'll, I'll try stuff that's way low percentage just because I know that I can't get it on, on the higher level people, but I, I, it's kind of, I don't know, safer to try it on, on, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, but at the same time, the stuff, the high percentage stuff that I know that works, like picking the hand that you've heard that, that everybody, when they hear FMA, they think of the defang, the snake thing, mm -hmm. just taking apart the hand. Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. So if if we're sparring, I just if if it's somebody that's kind of a high level, I'll I'll go for their hand, and if I get it routinely, okay, now I'll move on because I know this guy can't move his hand, and in a real fight, he'd be handled. So now yeah, let's yeah. do let's do something that I'm less successful with, and you kind of it's like those tests that they that they make you take. Like the nursing test was like this: every question you got right, the next question was harder. Mm -hmm. So if I can pick the hand. Okay, now I'm going to try and pick the forearm. Now it's time for the harder question. Yeah. Okay, now it's time for the harder. Okay, now I'm going to try this, or you know, I'm going to try and faint and do this, or whatever. But yeah, does that make Did sense? Ever, it makes total sense. Did I ever tell you? I'm not sure that I did. Um, but uh, my my uh, theory is too strong of a word. But my idea about uh, about pain and mm -hmm. how pain is a necessary component to having a martial arts experience with other club mates. I like it already. And okay. So what I mean by that is, is uh, there's, there's, um, there's in this theory, there's three levels of pain, right? You've got your little owies that everyone goes through. You've got your hurts, but you can still function. And then you've got your injuries, right? Mm -hmm. And so injuries you don't want. You're being too rough. Someone gets injured. They can't just shake it off. They need medical attention. That's bad. That's way too much. Yeah. And little owies are, you know, the, the, the little owies, you know. Yeah. It's like zingers or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And then somewhere along the, the and there's this middle, middle ground, middle mm -hmm. ground. And that's your your hurt, right? And yeah. um, you know it's a spectrum, and so you you don't want too much hurt towards the injury. You want to dial it kind of halfway under towards yeah. the owie. <laughs> and for everyone, that's different, right? That threshold yeah. is different, and that's where the discussions come from. That's where you develop trust mm -hmm. with your fellow mates, and that's the thing that you can commiserate over yeah. like um i mean professionally you know you see these uh you know boxers or mma fighters they're making each other bleed right, right. um you know the whole thing they're supposed to act like they hate each other before the match yeah, just yeah. to create the drama and you know money flows more when they do that and so but anyway they get there in the ring and it's just mano y mano and no one else in the world experienced that fight like the two of those guys right right um and, you know, it always it always impresses me how, you know, these guys could be just bleeding all over. And at the end, there's a winner 
and they're both just dude that was an awesome fight and they're like fist bumping or whatever and it doesn't happen all the time but oftentimes yeah, it yeah. does like they have that respect for one another they sympathize with each other they empathize with each other they give you know that that little um salutation at the end whether it's a hug or a fist bump or even it's just a nod and a yeah. twinkle you know and um so anyway to me that's 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 necessary if you don't have some level of owie or a little bit of hurt i'll just say pain if you don't have a little bit of that low end mm -hmm. pain um you it becomes a casual experience and you're not creating bonds yeah no 100 percent. deeper bond yeah and i'm not i'm i hate pain like i'm not that kind of guy yeah, no. who loves to instill pain but but we it's a necessary it component yeah we call those guys pain sponges <laughs> why ain't that guy right no uh, -uh. but so, it, yeah so one of the things um well okay one of the ways that you and i have connected in the first place was uh the the idea of a I, I would even say just martial community in the pacific northwest like mm. specifically the hema community because that's certainly more your focus um we're a little bit more schizophrenic because we just if it's got a sword we'll fight it so. which is super cool i mean it's like you do this kelly and then you're doing you know the the, uh, the 29th of april we're doing a i think i think we're tentatively doing a uh, saber legion meetup at our school to to expose people and to teach people uh, saber legion, legion sword or uh, led saber fighting okay gotcha totally not totally not lightsaber fighting because lightsaber uh -huh. would in in uh call down the wrath of the mouse oh sure yeah right but so you have to call it led saber fighting i learned that that's important sure lead sabers yeah <laughs> so dumb <laughs> but anyway like that's that's our whole deal is like if there's if there's a sword involved we're in uh -huh. hey do you want to yes we're in so that's that's how when when we reached out to to you or had that single stick uh event uh, 2018 ish yeah 2017 about... maybe something like that Gosh, well, when was it yeah it was a while ago because it's because you came to you came to prosser for that that's when we first mm -hmm. met you and yeah. then and then the that the was a first... blast by the way it was so oh cool. man it i'm so looking forward to the sage rest skirmish i know we're ahead in our in our schedule what we're going to talk about yeah but i'm so looking forward to this the skirmish but yeah, but um uh what was it two years later i reached out to you guys and i reached out to uh portland sword guild and i reached out to the kdf guys in spokane because they're kind of the some of the smaller can you be small and prominent at the same time? It's basically the, the people that I could actually find, you know, yeah. without without looking under every rock and cranny that yeah. were HEMA fighters. And I was like, hey, we're doing this thing at, at the Prosser Highland Games. It'd be really cool if you just came and sparred and we kind of did a demo. It's just kind of a friend just screwing around thing. You know, please come if you can. Um, Portland had kind of a last minute deal that they had to they had to cancel out on. But uh, they were at the single stick thing a couple years ago. That's why we reached out to them. Yeah, and we know them pretty well. They helped us. Um, they helped us with our instructor certification for the the Scottish broadsword thing. Yeah, yeah but anyway, a good dude. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of how you and I met. So that's kind of a cool thing, as far as I'm concerned. You and I met with the idea through the idea. Of sort of getting the band back together in a lot of ways for hema in the pacific northwest you know yeah. like it, it's kind of ridiculous you're i don't know necessarily how specifically big your club is my club is maybe 15 people so like here's these two little like clubs. the same size yeah we have these I two little f clubs that are yeah that are trying to um convince other people to get back together because there's been this sort of I never understood it ripped. I was never cool enough to understand why I should be upset with other other clubs or something. But I just uh, Jay, I think, was the one. Uh, Jay from Portland was the one that came up with it, the cross pollination. Mm -hmm. Like when, so here he is, a, uh, a real dyed in the wool Hema sword fighter. Like knows more than I'll ever know. Has probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about Hema stuff. And uh, yeah, he's Lamont, a deep well, dude, 
Lamont contacts him and is like, hey, uh, to get our certification, we have to fight matches against people from outside of our school. Will, will you guys help us out? And he's like, absolutely. And so we go down there, we drive down to Portland, and we had a day where we sparred them. We had a great time, but it was, it was th this interesting thing because one of the things that, that I have prided myself on and that all of, all of my guys can do more or less is if you're doing Filipino martial arts, and, and you kind of, uh, you probably know it also, if you're doing one particular style, you can make yourself look like that style. And if you're yeah. doing another style, you can kind of make yourself look like that style. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the center of you is your style. Yeah. Right. right. And right. so, so for me, I teach uh, Scottish broadsword on Mondays from six to seven. And then from seven to eight 30, we teach the Filipino martial arts. So for an hour, I'm linear and, you know, the super precise footwork and inside guard, outside guard, all the things. And then in for the for the Filipino martial arts class, traditionally, Filipino swords had no guards. So how you keep your hands safe was moving your hands. Mm -hmm. So you have this hyper mobile, like very, you know, uh, boxery almost. You're moving your head a lot and moving your hands a lot. Very dynamic footwork. And uh, it was really fun when we were with Jay and Jay's people to see the, I think the four or five of us went down. So we had to have two matches videoed and sent in to the, to the uh, head instructors of the Katerin Society to get our instructor thing. So yeah. each one of us gets our two regimented matches and you know, thank you, sir, you know, and all that stuff. And you're like, you guys want to play? And they're like, oh yeah, let's play. And then we're like, okay, let's go. And, you know, we're wearing kilts and gambeson and all <laughs> the things but we're fighting like filipino martial artists yeah and <laughs> you that's know super fun because we've been doing we've been doing F filipino martial arts stuff for the previous you know five plus years for most of the guys there yeah and so that was that was switching into like the hybrid that you make of yourself you know so that that was kind of cool and so jay was talking about all these similarities that he would notice in our, our fighting styles or our movement styles to what he was doing. And we were doing the same to him. And he was talking about, or, you know, got to talking about the cross pollination of our clubs and how fun that was. Cause it was just so weird, you know, Filipino martial arts stuff, 30 some inch swords, no hand guards. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the tenants that we say is you close behind a slash and you finish with a thrust, right? It's, there Makes are sense. there are thrusts in the thing but as as you know as anybody in the martial arts knows or should know all martial arts come from a context right and matt easton is them probably <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and so um the, if you think about context himself for real so you think about um the filipinos and, and uh they were sort of somewhat as a hobby uh subjugated by any major power that came through that area for yeah hundreds of years, the poor, mm -hmm. poor country. Well, when the Spanish were there, when the Spanish first took them over, what did the Spanish have? Big steel breastplates, mm -hmm. right? Puffy shirts, puffy pants. And well, they had flintlocks or muskets or something. And cool helmets. And a really cool helmets. So uh, when, when, if you just isolate out our thrusting lines that are in our system, we have a, a low rising thrusting line that's aimed at the femoral artery. Okay. No armor in the femoral artery. We have a backhand uh, rising thrusting line. No armor in the armhole for the breastplate. Mm -hmm. And then we have either a lateral or a down sweeping uh, thrusting line to either go in the neck or across the throat. No armor in that area of the breastplate. Interesting. So that's cool. If I have a little thirty-inch bolo, I'm not going to try and make cuts to your rib cage, or I'm not going to lunge. And try and get you in the belly because that's mm -hmm. that's not gonna that, that dog don't hunt right yeah but what i what i can do is i can get close with slashes and be a problem because slashes are hard to deal with right especially mm -hmm. if it's a choppier sword as opposed yeah. to a lighter rapier style sword mm -hmm. if you can get close then when you get when when you get close piquiti tercia piquiti is close tercia is roughly like thirds so instead of close quarters, it's close thirds. Mm -hmm. um, if yeah, you're around cool. me or the FMA stuff at all for any length of time, you'll you'll notice there's triangles everywhere. 
<laughs> like that's like the logos are all triangles and stuff. Yeah. So it's close thirds, close quarters combat. So you get close with your slashes and then you finish in up close with the thrusts in all those places that are easy to get to through it, through the armor. That that's the context that that martial art was formed under. Mm. So one of the fascinating things when we transitioned or I should say added, we didn't really transition when we added Scottish broadsword to our uh, curriculum, the, th the thrusts are from outside guard, from inside guard and from hanging guard, like literally three thrusts in each system. You know, the, the, the Scottish broadsword is never really been known to be the, the thrusting man's tool. It's a hundred percent there. It's, it's viable, you know, you, you, but it's a, I'm probably going to get blasted all over for it, but it's a relatively choppy weapon. You know, you just happen to have a force field on your hand, which incidentally, I don't understand why it's never come up in star Wars. I would have a, yeah. I mean, the two greatest Jedi ever lost their hands. Wouldn't you put a basket on that thing? I'd want one, especially I, when, you know, later on they've got like these, um, you know, shields and stuff that could, yeah know, for the the saber blades so mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> i'd want one heck yeah and uh, uh give me a give me a force field buckler too i would rule the world yeah a oh basket, you, a lightsaber and a force field buckler you, it's on. you you missed the last episode of the mandalorian maybe i didn't ah okay well i don't want to do spoilers Actually, whatever. This thing, this show is going to air in April. So if you haven't seen that episode, then you're not a real fan. So that was probably my favorite thing in that episode. It's pretty cool. You added me as a Star Wars nerd. That's why I'm into swords is because right, Luke, Luke freaking Skywalker. That dude was just such a big hero to me when I was six years old. It wasn't even yeah. funny. I just thought, man, Luke Skywalker. He can. Mm -hmm. He's know, amazing. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm gonna put that down now. <laughs> Do it. You should. Yeah. We'll 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 start we'll start Star Wars nerding. Apparently, I yeah. I don't remember this, but when I was one and change, prob probably flirting with two years old, my dad took me to see the first Star Wars. No I was I was born in '75. Okay. So apparently, that's one of my mom's my mom's favorite stories. Is like my dad like my boy is gonna go see this sci-fi movie, and we went and saw. We went and saw Star Wars. So nice. I, I mean, I, I have always loved it. I do not remember that, obviously, that event at all. But I think it's pretty cool that it's in my history somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before you could string full sentences together. Yeah. You're... <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, that, like I said, the cross-pollination and the getting, you know, I. what's interesting is there's another guy in Portland. His um, uh, name is Morgan. And he did a thing yeah, called the, the Short Blade Symposium. Uh -huh. And um, I met a couple people there um, who are actually going to help us put on the Sagebrush Skirmish, mm -hmm. uh, Tony and Julian. They're, they're doing a bunch of the heavy lifting on the, uh, as what I consider the hard part. Like um, Julian has like a rule set that he's been flirting with that we're going to look at. And he also is coming yeah. up with the, like the bracket, like, like the, the, tournament format mm -hmm. so we're gonna have 40 fighters total let's let's just start talking about it because i'm gonna i'm gonna nerd out about yeah it okay let's do it then let's let's get into it so um <clears throat> let's let's set the table so yes. a sagebrush skirmish june 17th at the prosser highland uh games games right? yeah yeah at the prosser beer and wine park i think is what it's called okay if you if you look up prosser highland games you'll find it yeah but so again fostering this whole idea of kind of revamping or, or rekindling hema uh, uh in the pacific northwest um we did a single stick tournament and we loved it and everybody had a great time Fantastic. and and one of our sort of secret loves has been sword and buckler stuff um one of the other uh one of the other broadsword instructors and i went to a sword and buckler tournament in portland a few years ago we fight it all the time as we can. Um, we, we, one of our guys that just started, um, he had a line. I can't remember how, what hook and crook he did, but he, 
somehow with a company that he works with, he can get stuff through Cold Steel uh, relatively cheap. And yeah, so really. I think we just bought six bucklers, six Cold Steel bucklers, mm. and it was like filthy cheap. It was it was like half of what it was supposed to be. <laughs> oh, nice. So so we were just like so awesome. Like so now we have literally a buckler box. <laughs> it's just stacked with these Cold Steel bucklers and. You know, like when we first started it, uh, my first uh, training buckler that I had, I kid you not, was a uh, five inch steel dog bowl uh, nailed and like <laughs> uh, bent over nailed to a piece of uh, quarter inch plywood uh -huh. with, a, with a handle that I had that I had made. Like it, it was the most like sketchy. The cool thing, it was light. So you could sit there with it out, you know, so you don't get uh -huh. lazy buckler syndrome. You could sit yeah. there and, and swing around and your your shoulder didn't fall off after 10 minutes like that you do for the cold steel ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, that that's where we started. And now we have like a whole box full of them. It's pretty great. Yeah. But anyway, so we were like, let's so, do something weird. Like we can't if we kind of felt like if we did single stick and then messer slash saber that's kind of inc infringing on uh, Morgan's turf, like a little bit. Cause he had, yeah, he had a, he had a knife tournament and then a messer tournament. Mm -hmm. His kind of thing was uh, blending the FMA and HEMA together, which was great. I, I absolutely love that concept. Obviously. You know what I like about Morgan, just a, a side note is, is uh, his drills are so crisp. Um, Mm. I anyway, that's no, it's it, that's a good point. He's yeah. he's super meticulous with with how he presents yeah. stuff. Uh -huh. His uh, he's also got a pretty good handle on the social media thing. Yeah, well, like like what he puts out as far as like school school stuff. But um, uh, the so the sword and buckler thing, we're like you know, sword and buckler is kind of niche. Like even HEMA people, like that's for most of them, it's sort of a. It, it, it's the car that they like to drive, but it's not the one that they show everybody, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, like it's, it's the, it's the, uh, the Volkswagen Beetle that they love, but the, but it just isn't as cool as their Camaro. Yeah. I think for some people and it's, you know, cause every, it seems like everybody in the HEMA community, they either want to learn like British military saber or mm -hmm. they want to learn long sword. Mm -hmm. And then or some rapier, of the, maybe. and and then yeah, like if they, yeah, if they're uh, live next door to an SCA guy, they do some rapier stuff. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but but the like sword and buckler, they're like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. I I fought a, a sword and buckler versus long sword match or two, and those I don't feel outgunned at all. Yeah, it's so great. Like it's it's just a fun weapon system, yeah. and and um, I mean it was it was a common weapon system for like six hundred years or something. Mm -hmm. Like it brings that's a lot amazing. to the table, right? Yeah. Exactly. That little that little buckler does so many things. We we tell people that it's a force field on your left hand. Because <laughs> it's it's just it's it basically says to you, I'm shutting off this whole quadrant, yeah, for the most part, and like you have to be a KG so and so just to get around it with me, sticking my arm out, like you know, mm -hmm. if if that's all I do, you have to be pretty pretty dedicated to get around that. Yeah, and bucklers they don't they don't wear you out like a full size shield does. And with the buckler, you can move as fast as a sword, well, almost as, I mean, you can't move as fast as a sword tip, but yeah. as far as the sword hand, you can yeah. definitely move as fast as a sword hand and maybe even the, the, the first third of the sword. It, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Maybe technically you're a little slower because of leverage or whatever, but, but yeah, so that's, that's really cool. And you can just move it wherever it needs to go and you could almost keep up with the sword. Yeah. So and and so that's we were like yeah we should do a sword and buckler thing, and that yeah. that'd be really cool and because the there there's some people around here that are pretty high level sword and buckler fighters, and then we're like well but who are we gonna who are we gonna invite and you know blah blah blah, and then we're like you know what we should do we should have like an invite only thing for sword and buckler, and then everybody else we we could invite to the um, the single stick thing, because so like. Traditionally, the Scots and the, the British military would have uh, single stick tournaments like like the modern army has uh, golden gloves competitions. Yeah. See who's the toughest, you know, or whatever. Right, well, yeah. if, if you're if you don't have uh, M4s and you happen to have basket hilted broadswords, how do you find out who your best swordsman is? You find a way to train with basket hilted broadswords safely or mm -hmm. safe ish. 
So say fish, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so we're like, let's do that. Let's so so now it's it's very approachable for anybody. So they can come to our thing and they can do they can do single stick and then we can do an invitational for uh, a little bit more experienced people. So like you could almost sort of invite instructors to the one and then they can invite their students to the other. Everybody wins. Everybody gets to compete. Yeah. They can carpool. <laughs> you know, like let's, let's yeah. be honest, like the tri cities is kind of in the middle of a lot of places, but it isn't any place particularly big. Right. It, yeah, it, that, which is right. kind of bizarre. We, we have like 200 and some thousand people in the metro area, but there's like, 20 people in our school and we're the only HEMA school in the whole Tri-Cities. In a sea of farmland. Right. Like it, it's super strange, but, <laughs> yeah. but that was our thing. It was like, like we'll have the single stick for the, for the, anybody that wants to try it. And we'll have the sword and bucklers for the more experienced people. And then like, okay, what's that going to look like? And then we're like, well, we'll invite each school can invite two people. Well, now we got to find 12 schools to invite, <laughs> you know, yeah, right. we, we wanted to have like 24, 25 people. And so, um, uh, incidentally, one of the things we're going to do, and th this, I think this is the first time it's being announced, but, um, one of the things we're going to do, if you win the, the single stick tournament, you get to fight in the sword and buckler tournament. So now that's pretty cool. That's, that's a great, uh, yeah. carrot to, to dangle. Yeah. Yeah. You, for, I, I don't, I think we're also saying you can't fight in the stick single stick tournament if you're fighting in the sword and buckler tournament. Because it's, yeah, it's, it's intended better. to be a, a hugely disparate skill level thing. Mm -hmm. But that's what we wanted to do as far as the, like the top, the top sword single stick guy should be pretty good. Like, mm -hmm. like really, like in, for all practical purposes, he should be pretty all right. So um, that person, he or she, uh, will get an invite to the, to the sword and buckler tournament. Well, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, it should be pretty fun. So then, then we're like, well, how do we organize this? Because I think we found like literally for our single stick tournament, we found like a paper bracket online somewhere and we like filled it out by hand. And like, that's how we ran our last tournament. Yeah. And um, Lamont said, because we had met Julian and Tony at uh, uh, Short Blade Symposium the year that we went. And, and Tony or uh, um, Lamont's like, hey, Let's reach out to them and see what they suggest. And they were all in. As soon as we mentioned it to them, we made a four-person group thing on, on Facebook. We mentioned it to them, and they're like, dude, let's go. And they're like, we can help with this. We can help organize this. I guess I can't remember which one of them Lamont told me, but one of them like helped set up the tournament set up for Combat Con one year or maybe okay. for a couple years. Oh, nice. so, I mean, that's like, that's like real boy tournament stuff. Oh, yeah. And here like their pools probably had as many people as our whole tournament did <laughs> or will, you know what I mean? <laughs> yep. And so, uh, Julian like did the math and he's like, you know, I think, I think if we run the tournaments like this and if we can get, uh, two different, um, two different rings for, for the tournament, I think we can get 40 fighters done and everybody gets like at least like at least six or seven fights or something like that. Like That's you get a pretty amount of fights. You get a, bu a bunch of fights. The format's a little strange because it's, it's designed to be very fast, mm -hmm. but at the same time, that's kind of a cool format because you get more fights and more exposures. So really quickly, can I interrupt you just for a second? Oh, hundred um, percent. Yeah. So ab about the, uh, uh, about the, the, the rule set, can you say uh, what it is at this time? 100%. I can't. Okay. I, I haven't I haven't really dug into it. And it's one of the things that I need to look into like late this month here pretty soon I need to start looking at it. Gotcha. The, I, I know that um for the for the sword and buckler thing, it's gonna be bring what you bring as far mm -hmm. as weapons wise. Yeah. And there's there's gonna be a a relative limit to length, I think. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want somebody showing up with a forty eight inch rape here. <laughs> and and just hitting somebody from like the next area code yeah um but i think we're gonna pick a relatively middle of the road uh length that i can't i can't 100 like percent 36 remember. inches or something like that something like that it, it's 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 so lamont and i ordered pretty much bone bargain basement economy uh 
uh, basket hilts from Castile. Uh-huh. And I, I can't remember what length we ordered, but it was kind of whatever. Because at the time, we didn't know what we were ordering, you know? Right. Like, as far as we didn't have any much experience in the, in the in the system. But we pretty much ordered whatever the basic was. So c- kind of around that, whatever kind of the standard. And I, I want to say it is somewhere around 36 or something like that. But that, that's, that's not a quotable statistic. Right. Typically... Um, between well 38 is kind of long yeah I, I, i've seen them that but usually they're any they're like 36 34 32 yeah. maybe um but that's reasonable 32 i think anything less than 32 is getting kind of short i yeah we were playing with well i'll, I'll different story for different yeah, time. whatever it is we'll, yeah. We'll, yeah we'll we'll work on that um i do know so we're we're going to be under the hema alliances uh insurance policy so armor wise, you're going to need uh, leg armor, including kneecaps, hard, hard kneecaps, yeah. hard elbows, gloves, uh, 350 gambeson mm-hmm. uh, mask. And I think I think I'm going to encourage back of head, but I don't know if Hema Alliance does. I want to say they might. I think it's I think I would it's recommend fun. it. I a hundred percent do, but I, I know there are some rule sets out there that it's not because it generally the exchanges are so linear, right. but I, I, like I said, I don't know what, um, I don't pour over HEMA alliances requirements. Right. I would, I mean, if you don't got one guys, just get one. <laughs> it's just better. Um, you, you are kind of playing with your, with your life. If, if you don't, I mean, if you get hit wrong, you'll be to quote a line from one of my favorite Western movies, you'll be strange for the rest of your days. It's pretty, it's pretty just, wonderful. That's a great sentence. Yeah. It's oh man. Open range. Great movie. Um, great. But anyway, yeah. Um, just, just get one. Um, because anytime you have a shield, even if it's a, a buckler, it tends to, there's the option of it suddenly not becoming linear. Suddenly yeah. you, there's like traversing and you just need a little traverse and the wrong kind of hit. And it's mm-hmm. back of your head. So uh, Lamont has a video on, I can't remember if it's on the Blackbird training group page. A, a slight aside on the, on the journey for me. Okay. Um, Blackbird training group is what Lamont created for uh, his school. Mm-hmm. And he didn't call it like Blackbird Pekiti Tersiakali or whatever, because he knew that it was just going to be general for training. He, he was very much interested in, He's one of the most well-read and rounded people for martial arts information I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and so he kind of knew ahead of time that he was going to do other things within his school. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's the Blackbird training group. So the Blackbird, uh, is, because as we're in the Pacific Northwest, it's the, t- the totem style uh, Blackbird, the raven, right? In... in uh, native american lore the the raven is the trickster in a sword fight you don't have to be strong but it really helps to be tricky yeah, I like right that. and so so that's where blackbird training route came from well when um we were pursuing our uh Katerin society uh instructorships one of the things when you got your instructorship you had to establish a, a broadsword academy and it had to have broadsword academy in the title and I had decided that I had uh, I had already had my instructorship in um, my guru rank in um, uh, Pekiti. And I, I decided, you know, if I ever have a, my own school, I'm going to call it Black Feather something because it's not it's a part of the whole Blackbird, but it's not like it comes. That's where it comes from. Yeah, like I, right. I always thought that was like cool, you know like Blackbird Tactical or, you know, because you have to say tactical in the name if you're going to do self-defense stuff or whatever. <laughs> and um, when, when we had to have a, a, a Broadsword Academy name, I was like, you know what? Let's, let's do Black Feather Broadsword Academy. I think that'd be really cool. And uh, uh, Lamont was uh, very much the head instructor for uh, Blackbird Training Group. And I, I volunteered like, we all we are all instructors of the same level in the Katerin Society, but I sort of said, you know, I'll head up the Broadsword Academy because I was a senior student like under Lamont, so that'll kind of be my baby. So I like pay the insurance and you know I, I do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but 
that's kind of how I got to name it and, and how it's more or less it's, it's mine. But at the same time, all of the instructors help out and, you know, it's this kind of collaborative thing. So that's yeah, where black, cool. that's why we have blackbird and black feather. They're, they're kind of two things. Yeah. So at the, the Highland games is going to be uh, for black feather broadsword academies stuff. So yeah, that's okay. That's where that comes from. Just, just dig just to, it. To, yeah. It's, it's pretty great. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's, anyway, uh, yeah. So, yeah. so the um, the Hema Alliance rule set. Uh, I, 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 I like I said, I don't remember if it requires back ahead or not. But on Blackbird Training Group's webpage or the Black Feather Broadsword, um, I mean YouTube, we have two channels, and neither one are. Well, the the, the Blackbird Training Group one's pretty active. Lamont keeps sticking stuff up on there. We haven't done nearly as much on the on the black feather one just for one reason or another but on one of them it has a really really cool back of head armor that he found mm. where you use like a catcher's back of head armor mm -hmm. and then a throat protector from lacrosse as your <laughs> as your beaver tail yeah and then you you like attach them with uh, zip ties or something like that oh i dig it so so it's like it's articulating mm -hmm. so you 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 uh, attach it to the beaver tail of the back of your fencing mask. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's shaped such that it just covers that back of your fencing mask. And then you pop it up, slip your head on, and then it's, it covers everything. It's, it's yeah. pretty great. Yeah, that's cool. I have a giant head, so I had to make mine out of leather. <laughs> yeah. I, I made it out of I... leather and then I hardened it with uh, this stearic acid or something. It's like, Oh, it feels yeah. like plastic. It's pretty great. That's cool. So you you hard boiled it or whatever. You yeah. Call. Yeah. So with this special stuff, but but back of head armor is super super important. Yeah. Well, you guys are are pretty amazing. For me, I took the easy way out. I just I just ordered a, a back of the head protection thing from Spez. Spez, yeah. I never looked well, back. It's like wearing a carpet, man. They're so hot. Well, maybe that's my problem because I, yeah, I, uh, well, it's just the back of the head thing. It's not, yeah. I don't have. No, no, like, that's what I'm talking about. I have one of those. Yeah. It's so hot. I'll show you because I have, huh. I have two fencing masks. Okay. One has Lamont's thing. So when we get together, one has Lamont's thing. And yeah. then uh, I have my nice one that has the, the leather. I'll show yeah. you both of those. Well, maybe that's my problem. I run hot anyway, and that's why yeah. I'm kind of like the doofus who doesn't have a leather overlay over my thing you know right, over right. the top of my mask because right. uh, i don't want to just you know this is your this is just your brain drug. on drugs happening mm -hmm. inside my noggin just, <laughs> just well you, don't, you also don't want to have a CPU. In there. you don't have a cpu fan blowing the cold air in there <laughs> i should i should you know on, on a side note I, i'm really kind of wondering um what kind of mods i can do to my getup to where I am introducing cooler air or at least expelling out the hot air is like, yeah. is like an actual push. And so, uh, man, I would love to collab on with, with other people who have good ideas and come up with something for the community because, uh, I can't be the only one that just runs super hot. No, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a sweater big, like big, big time. And you yeah. know, those, those gamisons are ridiculous. I can't remember. Somebody made a longsword grade gambeson, and like right up until the ribs, it's all that beautiful 350 or eight. I think it's 800 Newton stuff. Yeah. And and then like the the middle of the back is like super cooling. That's what I I'm got. Like, I'm like that's genius, right? Yeah. But because mine is mine is uh the old school. It's like wearing a it's like wearing a carpet for for your your match. It's just so hot. Yeah. And the tri the Tri Cities isn't exactly known for their cool temperatures in the summer. No, and we're you know we're <laughs> yeah. I just need buckets of water that that in between. Yeah, you know if I don't lose the first match, it's I know I'm with you. I'll just hop in the bath or something. <laughs> we need like a horse trough. Exactly. Dip in the horse trough in between matches. <laughs> exactly. Hey, so so um, one one thing that I know that we had talked about a little bit, but I don't think we've touched on yet. Yeah. What? How do you teach your people's? Uh, allow me to ask a question for a moment. Yeah. 
how do you teach your guys uh, like what a acceptable level of contact is? Yeah, you know that's oh yeah that that's a that's a, that's a good question um, <laughs> because everyone has different ideas. Um, I, I think w really what it boils down to is as the leader of your club, you sort of set the trend, mm -hmm. and people just kind of take their cues from you how you treat the others in the club, and they they will match you, especially if if you just say things about it. Um, some people just want to hit harder. And, you know, I, I'm starting to think that physiologically some people just don't have the nervous system architecture to feather the the force. I, I don't I don't. So some people just hit hard no matter what. And, yeah. You know, they're the bruisers. And fortunately, if your club's big enough, you could just have the bruisers over there. Yeah. Um, but uh but those that those are there's only a few of those. Most people, I think, they just take cues from from me how I set the tone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I like to to you know really mix it up, and sometimes it's all about the scale, and it's just about getting the touch because you're working on, you know, pedagogically whatever it is that you're working on at that moment, that skill. You're trying to get that skill into your muscle memory. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure if I answered your question correctly. I just think it's setting the tone as the leaders, right? And that's another thing about uh, martial arts is it really is you need leaders leading the thing, right? And I, I mean, you're an awesome leader um, just in dealing with you, seeing you, talking with you. And so Thanks, I know man. that's, yeah, no, seriously, I know that, that you do that, you know, <laughs> to get on my soapbox. The world needs good leaders on a, on a, on a local level. You know, just even showing what it is, right? Yeah. And um, so I'm not saying I'm a great leader, but just setting the tone uh, in the club, I think um, I think that's the best way to go about it. I I 100% agree with your statement. Like that's – it's almost like I would have said the – like word for word. I, I think um, one of the things that – uh, is an artifact in a lot of Filipino martial arts stuff is part of the most well-known uh, organization within Filipino martial arts is the Dog Brothers. And one of their, one of their uh, fundamental sayings is higher consciousness through harder contact. And mm -hmm. um, there is no better way to test yourself and your personal skill and uh, like, can you hang? I, I don't know. Like, just spiritually, like, test who you are. Mm -hmm. Then entering into a, a fight with another person where you're both like, I'm going to try and hit you pretty hard. Or, you know, sometimes as hard as I can. You try and hit me as hard as you can. And at the end of the day, we'll hug it out. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about another organization that we're affiliated with in a second. But yeah. that, that's like, the, that's like, in a way, that's kind of what a lot of people aspire to. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they sort of hold that in highest esteem. Um, like, can you bring it? You know, that's, that's kind of what they say. And I think, I think you have to be able to and willing to bring it. Yes. At some level, but yes. at the same time, not to be a broken record, but you have to have a dial and not a switch. You can't have sparring mode and training mode. You, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to be able to, tune it up and down to who you're fighting. Um, and even within a fight, right? Like uh, we were talking about before we started recording, um, you have to be able to be fighting somebody. And if you're taking them apart, maybe it's just cruel to, especially if you're fighting a stranger, right? Like if I'm fighting somebody yes. that I've never fought before, I've been in a couple of uh, uh, sparring fights with, with folks and like maybe they're, I'm a pretty big dude. And if they're, if they're like my size, I'm going to be pretty damn respectful and, and you know, to, to figure it out. Like I'm respectful to everybody, I guess I should say that, but I'm yeah. going to maybe respect some a little bit more <laughs> when the potential damage coming my way is a little higher. Yeah. The repercussions are real after the fact. <laughs> right. And, and, and if I, if I get in there and I, and they take me into deep water, okay that's cool like i'm i'm fighting at a level that's that's appropriate but if mm -hmm. i start fighting and they're just starting to get blown out or they're backing up a lot because 
I'm just taking their hand apart. Well, you know, maybe I'll try different. I'll, I'll try more technical stuff. I'll try stuff that challenges me as a fighter and, and challenges them as a fighter. I'm yeah. not just going to give them the fight, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not, and I'm not going to either. I'm not going to obliterate them either. Right. Like, yes, that, 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 that's that finding that thing that at the end of the thing, I want to be able to have you respect me for being an honorable fighter and, and you, you respect me. Like, like I want it to go both ways. I want to, I want it to be a good thing. Um, yeah. I, I, I fought a guy one time and, um, I always treat the stick as a sword. That's just my thing. That that's my, my journey. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, this guy's journey was a stick is a stick when it's a stick. It, it, if he's training with a sword, it's a sword, which I get it. That's, that's fine. And very first exchange, I do a big, you know, establish some respect. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some power. And I throw a big number one and he catches it on his, on his arm right here. Bang. And he, he returns back. So I hit with a, I hit, hit his arm and I had to, I had to come back to the roof and then we split a little bit. And I was like, damn, he just took everything I had on his arm. <laughs> like this guy is capable of sucking up some punishment. And we had a pretty good yeah. fight. And like uh, later, later in the fight, uh, I, I, came with a roof and I crashed him. I wrapped up his arm, stabbed him in the belly once, hit him in the thigh once, stabbed him in the head. And then they broke because, you know, we weren't doing takedowns Yeah, because that was part of the agreement before we started. He didn't want to get taken down and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I mean, my judo and Aikijitsu background, every time I go, I'm like, I don't care. Let's go. Like, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable however the fight wants to go. And <clears throat> um, we broke. And then after the fight, he like big hug and he's like, oh, Thanks, man. That was a great fight. You really had my leg. You could have really, you could have really done some damage. And I was like, in my brain, I was like, I knew I hit your leg. You damn sure know I hit your leg at least twice. <laughs> Why would I hit your leg six times? Right. Like everybody in the room knew that if that was a real blade, you'd be, you'd be stumpy. Right. Like, yeah, like, like, and I don't, I, I just, I, that, but that's not my journey. Mm -hmm. Right. My journey is if I was in a real boy sword fight, God forbid, I'm pretty confident that I, I'm going to take very, very limited damage. If I crash in on, on almost anybody, I can get, I can get a one. So I crash in, I wrap the arm, my hand always comes back. I always get one thr thrust in the belly. I always bring it around here so they can't stop that arm. I get them on the head. And then I get one big chop on the leg, almost guaranteed every single time you get a minimum of three hits. It's mm -hmm. just, that's just, if you're aggressive and you, you do that particular crash, that particular way, you can usually hit three times Yeah. in a, in a real boy zombie apocalypse book of Eli sword fight. That's what people would have to deal with from, from me for the most part. Right. And if, if it takes six chops to get through that guy's leg, then it's going to take six chops, but I'm not going to throw down six chops in a sparring match just because that guy doesn't have a pain gene, <laughs> right? Just because he's right. just because it didn't hurt him enough, you know, and it's cause yeah. then, then I'm not, then I'm fighting to his journey and not mine. Does that make sense? It does. And, and, um, <clears throat> you know, just thinking about that, why, if you, if you have an opponent, and you have um, you have uh, successfully overpowered them the way that you train to, the way that you want to, and take mm -hmm. full advantage of that to the point where they're hurting a lot or that you're making them look bad or foolish. Yeah. You know, you're, you're burning a bridge, and why would you do that, right? Because you yeah. could establish this amazing uh, working relationship with, this type of person you know like you're saying before especially if they're a stranger why wouldn't you want to make a positive connection you know within your community as opposed to you know maybe this guy's going to hold a grudge maybe yeah, you know there's I trouble i mean yeah. you know all, all of that stuff um and life is just better when when you know people who are especially in in your community right it's such a niche thing why wouldn't you want somebody respecting you 
and helping you on your journey as you're helping them on theirs. I mean, absolutely. You're not enemies. No. So, um, the dog brothers, like I said, was, was one of the things that everybody looks to for, for guidance as to like what you should aspire to be as a Filipino martial arts practitioner. Um, Lamont and another, uh, instructor from Seattle named Belton, uh, they started a thing that they called Tipon Tipon, which is mm-hmm. roughly in Filipino, like gathering. It, it's yeah. kind of like somewhere, somewhere around, uh, like family reunion ish gathering kind of thing like like friendly gathering or something yeah and so tipon tipon is a thing where um we meet at belton's twice a year now i think the next one is in october you should go i'll come get you if you want i'll 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 drive down there and then we'll swing up (laughs) but but uh so the cool thing is it is 100 percent uh two people entering into an agreement to spar Mm -hmm. and it's literally an agreement hey nate uh i haven't done stick and dagger in a while are are you down and you're like i'm not really a stick and dagger guy would you fight if i did stick and buckler would you still want to do stick and dagger i'm like yeah sure you know i i kind of jack my knee though uh i don't want to go to the ground so like maybe if you crash we can clinch or something oh yeah sure that's fine cool Good, thanks. That's a great time. And then and then you go fight and you spend two minutes and you fight and you hug it out at the end of the match. You always protect you. I'll always protect me. And the idea is we're friends at the end. Cool. Mm. And then, the, you know, maybe the next time I'm fighting somebody else and I'm like, you know, <laughs> I fought six matches today. I am smoked. But I really like what I saw with some of your matches. Would you do like a light technical fight with me? The guy's like, dude, that sounds great. And so we fight. I will say after we've started the uh, Scottish broadsword stuff, Mm -hmm. every single Tipon Tipon, I fight somebody with uh, steel. (laughs) Because in general, uh, most FMA clubs just fight with rattan or Mm -hmm. aluminum training knives. But but steel weapons are super baller as far as they're concerned because it's weird, right? And so uh, I have some of those uh, training hoodies, the, the 350 Newton training hoodies. Yeah, I bought three of them for the club. Mm-hmm. And so I have loaners. So if somebody wants to, hey, uh, I saw you guys playing with the, or you you brought the, we have like a, um, a soccer mom cart that I pull out of my truck and we put all our gear in. Yeah. They're like, I, I saw your steel swords in the in the wagon. Uh, could would you fight with those? I'm like, oh heck yeah! And so next thing I know, I'm doing a I'm doing a sword fight, a steel <laughs> sword fight at a. It's not an FMA thing, but at a at this T bone T bone thing, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's cool. Like anybody will fight anybody, anything with anything. It's, it's kind of like diet dog brothers in a lot of ways. Like <laughs> the, the idea is we, you can a hundred percent bring the intensity of a dog brothers fight. If you want to, if, if you're like, Hey, I got a, like we said uh, before recording, you're like, Hey Jim, I got a, a dog brothers uh, gathering in uh, next month. I kind of want to take it up a little bit and, and, you know, really see if I have it. Are you, are you down? You can pull me into deep water. I don't mind. Let's go, let's do this. And we go yeah. out and we fight and we have a great time and you grapple me and maybe you stick choke me and well, crap, I've never seen that stick choke before. So we hug it out. And then afterwards we kind of scoot off to the side. I'm like, dude, you've got to show me that. Cause that was super effective. And then we talk about that and we make a new connection and things are great, you know? And, and that's, so in, in the Filipino martial arts community, we've sort of already started what, doing what we sort of want to do in the HEMA community. But like as a club, we sort of just want to do that totally. Like you, if you make it to the Tipon Tipon in October, I 100% guarantee you're going to have a great time because yeah. everybody there likes to spar and everybody there is playing with a, playing with a blade or a stick. It's, mm-hmm. it's just so, you know, it, for for some of the stuff you're going to be a little bit out of your element because you know some yeah, people. Yeah, but that's part of the fun. A hundred percent. You know the 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 tip that I would bring is uh, bring something weird that that we don't see a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah, like uh, bring your full your full size shields. I think. Because oh, we don't cool. we don't play with those. Yeah. My oh. my son and I made a couple like um, 
uh, reproduction. Uh, Thegan Thran, those those two clowns on on YouTube. Yes, we made round shields following their recipe with the, <laughs> the linen and the glue and all that stuff. Yeah. So we have a couple of those that we fight with, that we spar with like a little bit, but nobody fights with big shields. That mm -hmm. they would dig that. They, they would find that so interesting. Oh, I would. I would find that so interesting. But that's the thing is like people, if if I go to class every week and I fight with one stick or two rattan sticks, that's what I fight with every day. So mm -hmm. when you go to Tipon Tipon and you're fighting strangers, I'm gonna want to test how good I am with a single stick or two sticks. Well, not two sticks. It's I, I don't I don't try and do that. Yeah. Or with a knife. So we we generally warm up with a, a knife fight or a dagger fight. Um, and that's a whole bunch of fun. And then your next matches, you can do other things, weird things. Yeah. Invariably your middle stuff. So you'll do, you'll see people do a lot of knife stuff and then you'll see a lot of stuff that people are comfortable with. And then people start hanging, flying their freak flags and doing weird stuff towards the end of the day. You'll see, <laughs> you'll see spear, you'll see tomahawk. You'll see just all the weird stuff comes out a little bit later. Cause people are like, okay, I've, I've checked my boxes. I've tested myself with the things I want to test. Is that a frying pan? <laughs> <laughs> you know <Frying> pan. <laughs> so there needs so to that, be a treatise on the frying pan <laughs> there probably is <laughs> it's probably it's probably a, a walk actually it's probably a chinese treatise probably oh you know what i wouldn't put it past that yeah that'd be cool <laughs> but you know so that's that's kind of like like if you're looking for influences you know you, mm -hmm. you kind of have the dog brothers is sort of what everybody holds themselves to and then we try and we try and encourage people getting to that level of, of um, contact. Yeah. But like you say, uh, Lamont and I have always tried to be uh, sort of lead from the front. You know, Lamont very much for me was, was a, um, like he was the, I, I'm a big guy. I weigh, I weigh 240 pounds right now at like five, eight. Lamont is, uh, not, not nearly as big as I am. Uh, he's he's um, probably I don't know. I'm not even going to hazard a guess. I'm I'm yeah. I'm long past my carnival barker guessing weight days. But um, <laughs> he's a smaller guy than I am, and he's always been hyper mobile. He's always been very fluid with his movements. And from the first day of my martial arts journey with with Pekiti Tercia, I've always tried to replicate or at least uh, emulate his movement styles. And yeah. uh, 10 years later, I'm, I'm, I move a lot like him for a giant guy. That's just, that's how I conduct myself. You know, that's my, my martial arts journey. Mm. And so like, that's how I test myself is by, by doing this kind of thing. And, and I don't know, I, I can't remember where I was going with that, but it's just, <laughs> it's just part of the journey is, is taking what you know. Oh, uh, like as far as uh, how how impact and stuff. So yeah, yeah. his movement influenced me. His level of contact influenced me. And so now mm -hmm. I try and do the same for other people. Like I try and I try and uh, by how I'm willing to engage them energy level wise. That's yeah. how they know, you know. And the one thing that I always also kind of try and make clear is just be careful because the level of energy that you give is the level of energy that I will give. Yeah. And that seems totally natural. I mean, that just kind of yeah. seems like, um, the, when that organically happens, all is right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I will say there is a, there is a reset button for a lot of folks mm -hmm. and that is the thigh shot. Oh yeah. I can see that. Nobody likes getting hit in the thigh. Like how, how many times have you got hit in the, in the forearm? Probably in the hundreds. Yeah, yeah probably. Uh, uh, chest. I, I'm, I'm trying to this thing lately where I'm trying to fade out. So I, I move back so I don't, my feet don't give up a whole bunch of space, but my chest does. So it might gets mm -hmm. my head out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so I've been taking some shots on the top of the chest a little bit or yeah. like on the top of my shoulder a little bit as I'm, I don't quite get out enough. And so I'll get clipped a little bit. Those are a hurt, you know, they're not an injury. Yeah. We use the same terminology is, is really funny that you mentioned that. Oh, wow. Hey, okay, hey, yeah. did, that, did that hurt? Yes. Are you injured? No. Like, <laughs> cool. Well, but, I, I didn't make that up. I heard that and I really liked it. 
Yeah, no, we we've adopted the exact same thing. Yeah, I think uh, but, David Hebron was telling. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was talking um, with me. And that's his thing. He's he's been to a whole bunch of the Tipon Tipons. Yeah, he sure really he's, likes it. He's been we to like were, four or five of them. We were gonna go. He and I this last time, but it just it just fizzled out. Life just got in the way, and it kind of yeah. sucked. So life always does. Yeah, but. But uh, so like I'm I'm trying to get this thing where I'm just barely getting out of distance so I can I can make my repost faster, you know mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, every once in a while, uh, every once in a while you get clipped on there and that, that's kind of stingy. Well, you get one good thigh shot on somebody or or one good thigh shot or just above the the knee on the just the outside of that thing, man. <laughs> that sometimes that makes people talk to God a little bit and they're like, <laughs> they're, they're going to make some, they're going to make some, uh, requests to not get hit there again. <laughs> but the thing is, if they're, if they're going ham and they're, and they're trying to bash your head in or crush in the front of your mask, some, some drift shots where you, you hit them high and they block and you hit them high and they block. And then you go whoosh, drop your hand down. You catch them on that leg. You do that two or three times they'll they'll either go crazy and we'll have to break the fight or they'll turn it down because they realize that they're in deep water and it's not cool to get hit in the thigh all the time yeah no it's it's not oh i know those leg shots there's Oof. just there's just something about them they really sting they hurt. oh man yeah um that's why i really like fighting in a kilt yeah kilts are like they're like this sort of delicious armor that looks good <laughs> because you got all the pleats and stuff like mm -hmm. a, like especially like a well-made one not like a utility kilt utility kilts are so thin they're not yeah. like the ones i really like ut kilts i don't know if you've ever seen their their company they're out of utah okay uh they're a poly viscose you can throw that crap right in the in the washing machine oh good to know they're I, so I need great another kilt. yeah and they're yeah. like they're like 80 bucks maybe you uh -huh. can get some of their you know, some of their cheaper kind of simpler ones like stuff i would i've fought in my really nice ones a whole bunch mm -hmm. yeah that, the black the black uh one that i have yeah. i think it's like black steward or something i fight in that all the time and that's one of their nicer ones mm -hmm. uh but they're they're sort of bargain basement -y ones are like 60 bucks they're huh. super cheap yeah. and they i've gotten mine in like less than a week sometimes when i've ordered from them oh wow but uh they're that poly viscose they're a little bit thicker and stuff you get you catch one on the thigh or on the hip that normally you'd be like, like <laughs> a little tear runs down your face, you know. Yeah. With that that little extra padding, it's nothing. It's it's not as bad nice. at all. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're talking. We're discussing pain. So, um, one one interesting thing is, um, you've got Hema, mm -hmm. and then you've got you guys, your your group, um, you know, Filipino martial arts. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing a little bit before the disparity in what the comfortable level of, of pain is. Yeah. And I thought we wanted to uh, <laughs> talk about deep water. Uh, let's discuss that for a little bit. Um, okay. Why do you think there is a disparity? I'll just, I'll just uh, toss that to you first, and I have some thoughts on it. I have a fascinating answer that is super easy. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, it is a tolerance for risk yeah okay say more say more keep going so within the fma community for the most part it's not quite thuggery because these guys are way smarter than that yeah but there's a risk for injury or there's a tolerance for risk for injury that is a hundred percent accepted hmm. and like to really test yourself if you're if you're terrified of getting injured not hurt if you're terrified of getting injured then that uh, sparring session is going to be more real to you mm -hmm. right like yeah. that whole higher higher consciousness through harder contact thing um that whole dog brothers mantra uh, mm -hmm. for the people that are, are, that are down with that, um, testing yourself to a high level can only be done if you're kind of terrified of getting your hand broken. And so at the highest levels, do you remember the, um, 
sort of the original gangster uh, fencing masks that were a little more than like screen door mesh and canvas. Yeah. Like the really crappy ones mm-hmm. compared to the stuff now is like pretty good. Like especially yeah. the, three, the three weapon stuff like I use and you probably use them, you know, mm-hmm. the original gangster ones that were like, like a white canvas hoops and, and kind of this sort of crunchy looking. Mm-hmm. Those and um, like work gloves there are guys that fight at dog brothers with that. <laughs> you know, I make a pretty good living wage and, uh, it's based on my hands, like to be able to right. sew somebody together w- to make a plastic closure. So their scar looks really well. Uh, I have to have as much dexterity as I can, as I can muster yeah. my, um, tolerance for risk is for my hands is almost zero. Mm -hmm. so anytime that i spar i wear almost the best gloves that i can find yeah and i and i always cover my my elbows because i'm enough of a physiology nerd to know that if you blow up my uh my nerves in the back of my arm i will similarly be hosed and unable to do my job yeah so I don't wear hard armor on the arms. Uh, you know those uh, little hex armor pads, or they like you have knee pads that are like little foam yeah. hexes. I've taken full boy shots on the elbow with those little foamy things, and they have um, been very, very, very effective at attenuating that. So I, I find that a relatively high level of, uh, uh, or an acceptable level of protection. Yeah. So uh, what I like that's my personal thing. I think for for some people, they want to feel that fear of of flirting with injury. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part and partial to the whole Dog Brothers culture. And I think it tends to be part, sort of somewhat, at least somewhat identified to a lot of FMA, the higher level fighters in FMA, I should say. Yeah, okay. Um, I think there's also a gear situation. So, um, and then I could be, I could be way off, but my, my personal understanding is so like the S the SCA society for creative anachronism, Mm -hmm. they're very risk averse. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, uh, uh, cut and thrust stuff and, and stuff, their tolerance for touch or for, for contact is somehow even lower than the more conservative parts of HEMA. Right. Which it which is fine. It was fascinating because those guys are, are a problem. The the are higher level guys that we have even just locally. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't I don't know where these guys would rank nationally. They just mess us up all the time. Like they're they're oh. master rapier fighters and stuff. And you know, they're just one rapier is a hard weapon to deal with. Yeah. Two, sure. if you're if you're good with it you're a hard person to deal with. (laughs) Like it's a super great weapon. Like it's literally why it's one of the, the weapons that are highly regarded as a, as a fencing master's weapon. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's like an OP mono, we mono weapon. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if you, and if you speak that language now you're even better, right? Like it's very, very good weapon. So they've always had this really uh, high level of, uh, risk aversion, I guess. Mm-hmm. And they have the, uh, which is kind of ironic because uh, if you say that you're an SCA heavy fighter, everybody knows you can take a punch, <laughs> right? Like, cause those guys just wail on each other. They're, they're not quite the EMP maniacs, uh-huh. but, but EMP or um, SCA heavy fighters are pretty much renowned for just being tanks. Like yeah. those guys can, can take a beating and keep on going. Mm-hmm. And so, that's kind of another thing that you have that, that weird dichotomy of once you get to steel, now they're hyper cognizant of risk. Well, I don't know like current modern HEMA people, like where they came from or why they have the risk aversion that they have. But I, I kind of have this feeling like that it comes from a couple different places. Like one, um, it feels like there's a little bit of an education thing. Whereas the FMA stuff and karate and MMA and, and stuff is sort of, dare I say, blue collar, right? Like that's, that's a good way to put it. Like, like 
two kids rustling in the dirt and hurting each other and like and then they hug and then they're good right. whereas two kids in college you know with helicopter moms um yeah you know they're just different they're they're used to a different level of uh violence pain. violence yeah. yeah and so and so i think pain. yeah and, and you know, coming back to the the um, the rift that has happened in Pacific Northwest HEMA, um, I'm not going to use specific names, but there's there's a personality that has a reputation for um, being very uh, like speaking to the martial viability of of HEMA skill and kind of calling people on the carpet like you're going to, you're going to do this little touchy thing on somebody's arm and you're going to give him a point for that. Like that, that might nick him, but it's not a martially viable cut. And I have to say that I'm a hundred percent, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. But at the same time, back to the thing of, of respecting somebody's journey. Mm -hmm. Like I have to also understand that there's people that don't have a tolerance for getting hit that hard, you know? Yeah. He was the, a very interesting community. There's a lot of things. Anyway, it, keep going. It, and I'll, and it 100% I'll, I'll... is. So then even, even more bizarre than the sort of two sides of HEMA of the people that want to be martially viable and hit relatively hard and the people that want to be uh, technical-ish, mm -hmm. you know, you have the guys that are doing LED sabers, right? Yeah. You, have, you have the, uh, the um, saber lesion folks. And those guys are uh, risk averse for a different reason, which is I, I find pretty fascinating. So uh, historically, like if we're talking about gear, uh, historically, uh, Filipino martial arts would have uh, hockey gloves, uh, and a fencing mask, and a cup. <laughs> yeah, that's the holy trinity of FMA protection, right? Uh, uh, HEMA adds a gambeson and and then now people come up with really nice gloves and then like yeah. oh did you see those hard elbow protectors oh check oh uh you know if somebody gets stabbed in the throat how about a gorget oh that's a good idea right you know you have you have fma filipino martial arts that are attacking people and stabbing with uh, aluminum knives or rattan sticks at speed and they don't give a crap where they hit people they hit them in the throat they hit them wherever and they're they're not they're not looking for more pieces of armor to make it safer. Whereas yeah. HEMA, HEMA a hundred percent is hundred percent is. And, and then like, you know, your, your sword has to be such and such flexible and your Gamson has to be such and such penetration proof, blah, blah, blah. Well, then you have the led saber people for saber legion. And they're like, okay, you need hard, all this hard armor protection, right? Like, you literally have to have back of spine hard armor protection really and yeah and chest hard armor shoulders like um one of the bargain basement uh uh saber legion kit out things is to get a, a motocross chest gear rig mm -hmm. so you got the chest piece the black back spine piece and the shoulders piece and then you have like uh i think you have to have hard forearms hard knees and lower legs, gloves and a mask and bad back of head protection. So it's, it's kind of an up armored Humvee version of what wow. you're supposed to have in HEMA. Yeah. But <laughs> I will give them, I will give them a, a reason why okay. their sword sucks. It is literally an acrylic tube. Okay. So yeah. where, whereas HEMA has, a blunted steel spring steel blade mm -hmm. that can flex quite a bit and stuff. You're literally attacking somebody with a piece of a, a, a circular or tubular piece of acrylic plastic that has a pretty high. Well, I wouldn't say high. It has the ability to shatter in some place and make a shard of plastic. Yeah. Okay. So right. I sort of, I sort of get it. I, 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 I will say that I've sparred in like a t-shirt and uh, my gloves and a mask Yeah, pretty damn hard against people that swing for the fences. And we have yet to break one of our lightsabers. 
I'm huh. LED sabers. Sorry, Disney. Spine protection. I but, is but that because yeah. of all the spin moves? <laughs> I mean, why do you need <laughs> spine protection? <laughs> <laughs> I am not here to judge, right? I, <laughs> it looks great. It's it looks super cool. Rising, and yeah. it is cool. And hey, I am a Star Wars nerd. I'm an OG Star Wars nerd. So you April know. 29th, we're doing a thing at our at our school. Like you, okay, you, you can come hit people with lightsabers. That's that's LED the, sabers. LED, LED sabers. sabers with the right. LED sabers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Could you beep every time I say the other word? Could you beep uh, that out? <laughs> Oh man, I'd have to be so disciplined. Uh, yeah, no, they're LED. So you were you've yes. misspoken. They're LED. I have. Sabers. I have. Yeah, so anyway, but but so a little bit of it is philosophy. So you have you have this higher consciousness through harder contact thing, and then a little bit of it is cultural, where you have these college kids that have never been in a fist fight, uh, learning how to longsword fight, and yeah, then which is and weird. then a little bit of it is is shitty gear. Or, or bad gear, sorry, mm -hmm. pardon me, whatever language that was, you have bad gear that necessitates their level of, of uh, striking and, and armor. Mm -hmm. So in their own way, sort of each sword culture, or well, whatever, whatever you want to call it, each right. piece has their own, uh, their own way um, uh, uh, of limiting or of tolerating uh, what a hard attack is. And it's for a pretty interesting reason. Um, what yeah. I what I think is interesting is um, I consider it personally a great accomplishment when I can install a dial on one of my fighters. Because mm -hmm. so I have an SCA heavy guy who uh, was also doing some cut and thrust, a rapier and um, parrying dagger stuff. He's he's an amazing fighter. No matter you put a single like a rattan stick in his hand, he's a problem. You put a knife in his hand, he's a problem. You put a rapier and a, a parrying dagger in his hand, he's a serious problem. Like he's just a good fighter. That guy would be a good fighter no matter what weapon system he has. He's aggressive. He's fast. He's very athletic, right? And he was an SCA heavy, so he could take a punch. Like he's. <laughs> He's got he's got a lot of stuff going on. It was really hard when we were first when we were first working with him to to kind of communicate to him like, dude, you can you need to take it back a little bit sometimes. Like you don't always have to go ham. And it's been really yeah. awesome seeing him fight with some of these people, like going to T Pone T Pone, mm -hmm. like it was. It sounds stupid. It's sort. It, I don't mean it in any way That's other than it. the greatest honor. But it was like this proud papa moment when he convinced this other dude that didn't want. He'd never stick fought before, huh. and and my guy goes out and he's fighting with this guy, his very first stick fight, and he's like, KG around. He's like, bop, you know, and having a good time and like playing to this guy's level, and 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 like that whole. Uh, ambassadorship of hey come to this cool thing that i like and instead of just like i'm gonna obliterate you but but more like hey this is fun isn't this fun bop oh hey good shot on me you know like yeah. without being a without being like a oh yeah good shot you know or, or or like hanging his arm out there hit it oh good one you know like being sort of uh um uh, what, am, what am i trying to say like talking down to the guy mm -hmm. you know like but like like having a good time and having helping this guy have a good time and 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 helping foster this budding maybe love for this kind of weird ass sparring right? <laughs> like like what we do is bizarre to most of humanity yeah right and so like, why would was, you do that on purpose <laughs> on purpose right <laughs> and, and like why would you waste a whole saturday yeah. and, but that's kind of the cool thing is to see this guy who I knew was an amazing fighter now become a martial artist and now have the skill and the poise and the restraint to play at whatever level he needs to play. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't have to teach him how to fight. That was there. Right. You know, I didn't even I, like I've taught him like some skilly kind of stuff, you know, like, like it's different uh, uh, broadsword things or, some things in the FMA stuff, you know, 
and he gets it, but I didn't have to make him a good fighter. But but helping him find himself as a martial artist and and helping him find a dial yeah. so he could turn it up when he needed to turn it up. Like he he no BS got Spartan kicked across the floor one time by <laughs> That he was, he was a same kind of thing. This guy had wasn't a, a very experienced stick fighter, and my buddy was just taking him apart. And, and because like this guy was aggressive, and he was hitting hard when he was hitting hard, but uh, he was like doing things that uh, a kickboxer would do that had okay. sticks in his hand. Like so, he was kicking, and he was like moving, and you know when we we were teaching him like it's when you have two sticks in your hand jab jab cross like <laughs> if yeah. you can run two sticks like you box and this guy's like oh okay and so he's he's fighting my friend like this and my friend realizes oh i need to be a little better i need to turn it up a little bit because this guy's his kickboxing is coming through with the sticks so now i need to turn my stick fighting up so he did and this guy started kind of getting blown out well he just switched it into muay thai mode and <laughs> And he, he, he straight up, this is Sparta kicked my buddy like <laughs> across the mat. And it was just like, whoa, you know, it, it was that that thing of being able to ratchet it up. Like this guy would hit a little bit harder and this guy would hit a little bit harder. And then, you know, they had a good fight and they hugged it out and they've been they've been conversing and, you know, talking ever since. But two fights before that was the fight where he was fighting that guy that had never fought before. Yeah. You know? And so to see him, to see him at, at level two fighting this totally new guy. And then to see him at, at seven start to smoke this guy. And then he gets like, he gets like booted and then see him turn it up to nine. Cause now he had to like, now he had to kind of protect himself a little bit. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what we're looking for, right? Like, like to help people find that mm -hmm. instead of blowing away the guy at a two with a nine and blowing away the other guy with a nine, you know, just straight out of the gate. Yeah. Like it was just, re it's a really cool thing. So uh, I don't know, long, long, long winded story, but. Well, but it makes it fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's no, that, thank you for the story. That's uh, yeah, no, I, I, I like examples like that. Um, I, you know, did that uh, answer your question, by the way? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And uh, I kind of wanted to, to circle back to the beginning of the question, which was, you know, why um, do and it's not all, but a lot of a lot of HEMA clubs, a lot of HEMA fighters. Why is there threshold uh, or uh, risk for pain? Why is it so low? And uh, so um, I had uh, recently a, a really cool discussion with them. Um, with another uh, interview and cool. uh, he, yeah. And he brought up this term. Uh, let me try to remember the term. It was a uh, physical literacy. I really mm -hmm. liked that term. And this guy, he's very scholarly. And, you know, during the interview, he has, you know, lots of, um, um, you know, huge bookshelf, like in the back, mm -hmm. like literal books, bookshelf, the whole screen. So I thought, man, that's, that's cool. Cause I grew up in a house like that. But um, yeah. anyway, um, and, and he was very scholarly and, you know, he has been doing HEMA for a very, very long time. And um, well, at any rate, um, I just think a lot of people who get into HEMA, uh, a lot of them do approach it from kind of an archaeological sort of scholarly way that they, they want to participate in it. Yeah. And, you know, maybe more bookish, maybe didn't do a whole lot of athletic sports, you know, growing up. And just that, that, uh, that uh, physical literacy just isn't, as uh learned <laughs> as uh you know people who grow up kind of wrestling in the dirt and you know stick yeah. fighting and punching each other in the face and laughing afterwards i mean you know that that may seem brutish to you know a lot of outsiders or people who just aren't used to that sort of thing but yeah. it it's certainly you learn right you you get acquainted with pain you realize hey the world's not coming to an end yeah the pain is just pain i'm fine you know i'm going through this thing and, you know, I really like what you were saying about uh, everyone has their own journey. Yeah. And you have to respect people's journey. If someone really doesn't want to participate in that level of pain with you, well, you're kind of a jackass if you're making them do it, you know? 110%. Yeah. I totally agree. 
yeah, and so you you have to be very respectful for people. But anyway, um, secondly, I think well, one, I think that um, for for people practicing HEMA who are afraid of 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 that pain, most of them are probably newer, um, and they kind of get acquainted as they as they go along. I mean, it is I, I would say that's kind of pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. So we we tell our new students. We encourage you to spar, but we do not require it yeah. initially. Mm -hmm. I would say I will, I would not encourage, well, what's, what's the proper, I would not look, start looking to promote somebody to an instructor rank if they didn't fight. Right. Like that, that's just kind of like how, how I'm at. could you, right? So, um, if you want to fight padded sticks, um, that's fine. I'm, I'm still not going to promote you. Like the risk, the, the pain risk, I think is an important one. It's, it sounds yeah. stupid, but I, I a hundred percent agree with you. Like if you start sparring at a low level and you get used to it and the owies become ouchies and the ouchies become, Hey, <laughs> and then the hay becomes, Oh, that was great. You're there. You've, you've, yeah. you've arrived. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a sort of a natural evolution of, of how it goes. Honestly, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's how it went for me. Cause when we first like, and as a club, to be totally fair, we, when I started the first level of sparring was padded stick sparring. And yeah, um, right. When, so like a Moulin a, or we have a, we have an attack we call a we tick where it's you, I can't, it's, probably got some fancy German name, but you, from here, you attack with the flat of the weapon either, either way, or, yeah, I mean, there's okay. a couple different ways you can do it it's called a wee tick. And it's usually you're like, you're moving out of the way and you hit them on the side of the head kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, it, it's got a fancy name with a long sword and I can't, I can't, it's, it's totally like, yeah, it's virtual. You're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not you a you long switch your grip into the, well, you switch yeah. your, well, I don't have right, a sword right. in my hands. So yeah. 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 How <laughs> dare you, sir? Yeah. But, but, um, like that, that we tick kind of thing. Um, it's, it's stingy. Right. Mm. And, and you're like, pop. Okay. That that's cool. But when you're using, uh, like a classic, when we were kids, buffer sword, you got your half inch PVC with the pipe on it. Yeah. Well, you do that little wee tick thing. Your your stick is like, Meow, and then you know comes up straight, and and you're trying to be cagey and moving your stick around, and it's like you're swinging a noodle at somebody. <laughs> well, that's not cool. So we started. Uh, Lamont got some uh, solid nylon rod. Oh yeah, because it was still bendy, still mm -hmm. super bendy, and yeah. then you put you put pipe insulation on it. That makes a great padded stick, and it's a lot it's a lot more uh, flexible than rattan. Mm -hmm. It's got a big soft padded thing except it's kind of heavy and it sort of hits like a car. Yeah. So yeah, right. I would rather fight somebody with rattan and get a little stick hickey and it's maybe it stings for a couple days yeah. than this huge dog bite looking bruise because you give somebody a solid nylon rod and it's covered in foam. You just gave them permission to tee off and swing as hard as they can. Yep exactly and if you give somebody a, a trade-off huh if you give somebody a rattan stick there's almost initially especially there's almost a reticence to hit as hard as you can yeah because i think i think like based on a previous conversation a little bit uh if you hit me really hard i'm gonna hit you really hard mm -hmm. and so there's that judeo-christian thing of i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to do unto others you know yeah. But if you got a padded stick, eh, it's it's a padded stick. What's the worst that can happen? Right. Well, it's like getting hit with a car, right? Like it's really <laughs> a significant whack. Yeah, and you, so, you follow through a lot more with the with the yeah yeah padded thing. And and so that's I think that's part of that. Like when when I first started, we had those those padded sticks like that, and now we only use those for very particular training modalities, mm -hmm. like. Um, if, uh, play we're trying to move from from drill based stuff to kind of play 
thing. So it's like game gamify training. Yeah, yeah. So Lamont's doing some really really interesting stuff with that. I'm I'm like it's literally so hanging on the coattails of him. He's he's doing some really interesting things. Well, I I'll be honest with you. I think he's onto something. I mean, that's that's kind of we do something very similar. So, um, you know, even with the adults when they're new, uh, usually they don't have gear and they come mm-hmm. in. And um, first thing I do is I hand them like a foam sword. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yeah, so I have them play with the foams for a little bit. And, uh, you know, and we use them when we do um, like group fights and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's 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 a great uh, methodology for for like sandbox learning. You know, like you say, that yeah. like, like playing around. Um, and it also helps them get acquainted with getting hit. Yeah. Uh, and, um, also with, with HEMA, I mean, I, I do get a lot of people who don't really consider themselves martial artists, right? They, they, sure. a lot of them haven't done other stuff, um, not even really a whole lot of sports. And so they're getting stronger. So they do swing a little bit harder yeah. with these foamies and, uh, right. yeah. And so they kind of get a little bit more amped, a little bit more exercise. Yeah. They're hitting each other. They're following through. And um, the bind is actually really good with, with foam swords. Um, do you do the uh, uh, cloth-covered uh, foam swords? Yeah. 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 So um, I actually I, I get the, um, the, the Boohurt soft armor stuff. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, they're pretty inexpensive. It's just they're made in Eastern Europe. And it takes a little bit to get them here, but you know they're 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 fairly inexpensive, except for the helmets. You know, helmet is like 120 bucks, 110 bucks, or whatever. Interesting. Um, and, and then they're they're grilled. Yeah. So you can't use them with sticks or steel because it'll go through. So yeah, that's yeah. the only thing about them. They're kind of specialized. But, yeah. Um. But that's how I run my kid class. Um. Is is in that gear, and it works really good. But anyway, uh, I get them acquainted to the idea of getting hit so physiologically they're sort of getting used to the idea mentally they're like hey i'm getting hit i'm not getting injured it's a little inconvenient it's like i don't want to just sit there and take it and then i move them up to sticks and from there they buy their own steel like i don't provide steel in my club like a lot of other hema clubs do i provide sticks i provide synthetics and i provide uh, foamies that and so i kind of that's how i build them up yeah yeah that's great that's really cool. Uh, those yeah. those silk fencing uh, sabers. We mm-hmm. I bought a pair uh, right after you told me about them, and I, I waited the requisite six months or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it seemed like I ordered them, and then like the next calendar year I got them. It, it yeah. was pretty bonkers, but I love them. They're they're really great. Um, and like you said, I could see owning like four more, or something, just to be able to give everybody one and and yeah. just play at a really weird light level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're 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 pretty cool. And you know the synthetics, they uh, some of them kind of hit like clubs too, like like just what yeah. you, were, you were saying. And it, it's a little bit weird. Like they they, I think they hit harder than the steel. The steel bites. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, and it's just like rattan. It's just like yeah. rattan versus foam. The the like the plastic, the white plastic, uh, purple heart armory stuff uh-huh. looks great. Love it. Love it for drills the the classic highland basket is really great like they did a good job with how it looks um and if you're kind of going light it's totally fine but you start swinging a little bit hard one it for whatever reason it seems heavier than the other one but two it like i said it hits it hits kind of hard i would totally rather fight steel yeah just just it's uh, it just like you say it's bitier but it's not as like clunk it's not as Whatever yeah. that is, whatever physics are involved, right? I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know, but it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Materials are interesting, aren't they? Um, there's something really cool about steel and uh, there's nothing quite like it. Although for new students, it might be a bridge too far mm-hmm. at the very beginning for them to get into steel. Some people can take it, um, but I don't know. I yeah, find if I build them up, they stick around longer. So what I've done or what I've started doing uh, with a couple of my newer students is if we're drilling or um, I was fanboying for you earlier talking about how I like your seven cuts drill so much. <laughs> if we're doing that kind of stuff, 
there is nothing cooler on planet Earth than handing a brand new HEMA student a steel sword yeah. and then telling him we're going to do this drill. And they're like huge anime eyes. And they're like, <laughs> they're doing this real sword work with a real sword. And you're like, cool. Now, since you don't have the gear and stuff, what we're going to do is we're going to use this other sword and we're going to go through the thing. And they're like, mm. totally get it. They buy it. Right. Like, I mean, it's not like I'm trying to sell them to something that's crazy, but they yeah. understand. Yeah. Like you're, you're, you're sort of saying, here's this cool thing that we're going to do. And you hand them a steel sword and you're like, all right, now let's practice and let's play with it with something a little bit safer than this. Yeah. And plus I've kind of noticed, I don't know about your guys, but like, if we're just kind of light play, like something less than, than, than our monthly sparring. Cause we, we spar the first Monday of every month, mm -hmm. which you're invited to, too, by the way, if you have a weird Monday, oh, that you man, just that... happen to be a few hundred miles away in the tri cities. <laughs> The first Monday of every month is uh, open yeah. sparring. We didn't, we invite so anybody to, to come spar with us. Man, that is so cool. <laughs> but anyway, the flying car, so I get there fast. <laughs> the Tesla soon they'll, they'll they'll come out with it. <laughs> but um, you know, with that with anything lighter than just like regular sparring, um, just kind of like playing around. They don't put gamasons on. They. Like unless I unless I'm they they start to ramp up their intensity I'm like hey, you're you're not just screwing around now you're now you're sparring get your get your gear on, but you know I'll have them put gloves on I'll have them put a mask on like at the at the bone minimum yeah and then um, sometimes elbows, but for the most part that's you know that's kind of like their own personal level of I let them know that I I kind of like I expect you guys to have all the armor that you're supposed to have on. But again, Tri Cities, hundred and some time degrees in the summertime. Sometimes, oh, yeah. like you know, like catchers, le catchers' legs and hard arm caps and a gambeson and stuff. Like, don't forget your Gatorade. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, but but if you're just playing, if you're just like maybe you're going through the um, uh, Terran Society has a drill. Uh, it's a, they're the, they're doubling exercises. Uh, you attack me with a seven. I St. George. Yeah. And then I attack you with a, a seven. And then like, so we go back and forth. Yeah. And then I attack you with a one, you defend with an outside and then I attack you with a two and then we switch those mm -hmm. kind of things. Yeah. Those are cool. Those are great. They don't necessarily need all of the armor. Right. You know? And then what we, what I kind of do is I'll, I'll do one of those as a block of instruction and then uh, we'll do constrained sparring. So, uh, say we do, uh, the, I do a one, you do a two. So then you and I will spar. I can only do ones and you can only do twos. Oh, cool. Right. So then you're reinforcing, you're reinforcing the drill that you just did. Uh -huh. And, and it gets you used to, uh, you know, blocking on the outside, on a, on an outside and then reposting maybe, or. Or whatever, like well, whatever, but it helps reinforce that that drill. Yeah, which I, I have to say that's something I'm kind of working on. Like, again, back to the the struggles of the of the new uh, instructor. Like, I don't know how to write a lesson plan. I don't know how to like how do I form out a school a, a class or you know whatever. And so I, I'm kind of like, for months I've sort of been like, you basically regurgitate a bunch of thing into your hand, throw it on the wall and whatever sticks is what the class looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes in my self-defense class, it'll be sometimes as easy as, uh, I'll see something on, um, YouTube and I'll be like, yeah. mm, that's super great. And then, and then I bring it to class and then we, and then we experiment with it. I will say for my, my, my self-defense class, um, I'm sort of a facilitator. I'm not necessarily an instructor. I don't think, I mean, I have probably the most martial arts experience in the class, but we explore topics. I have things that I want in that curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, like I'm not the perfect person to teach you to how, how to punch through a right cross, or I'm not the guy that's going to show you how to do the perfect, whatever kind of choke. Yeah. But, but like self-defense kind of stuff or like a broad overview or, Hey, let's explore what knife grappling looks like. I can 100% help with that. And so I, 
that class tends to be a lot more collaborative. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to try and make it a lot more regimented. So we'll have like a warm up. What I'm kind of my next iteration of it is going to be like a 10 minute warm up, a 10 minute specific skill, and then the remainder of the class play. Yeah. Like kind of leaning back into Lamont's thing of just like playing with whatever skill that we that we did. And then for the broadsword class, um, uh, I'm going to start leaning back into, I would just people, cause I had so many new people. You have to go through all of the, the bone basics. You do. And that's kind of, you know, you want the new people in there cause it makes things exciting. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, you know, if you had a lesson plan, okay, we were going to do this thing. They're totally lost. Yeah. And then what do you do now? You got a bifurcated class and people. Yeah. Just, yeah. So it's, it's rough. What what I'm planning on doing for that is now the newest one of my people has an okay grasp of the basics. And so now I'm going to start leaning back in. So our, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not. Our um, instructorship certification came through the Katarin society. And uh, Christopher Thompson has written a, a few books and he kind of has a guideline for how, how you get your instructorships. Mm -hmm. And there's like five levels of instructorship. And so I'm going to start running through his curriculum and try and get my people up. So everybody's an instructor. Like, yeah, uh, it's my school. Sure. But I don't, I don't have to be the only instructor. Like, right. I don't, I, you know, it, it is one of those things like, in every in every club probably in your club uh do you guys have ranks not in my adult class uh and that's something that i actually want to happen because mm. um, there's certainly people who have stepped up who have been there longer who help out new people uh -huh. and who really demonstrate excellence right and so you want to recognize those people i haven't quite figured out honestly how to do that my my yeah. kids class i i have definite ranks Mm -hmm. um, just because I, I follow a, 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 a borrow from a curriculum, um, the old modern sword fighting, and then I overlaid my own thing That's on there. Cool. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you're a grown adult doing, you know, steel swords, I mean, you're going to say, oh, yeah, I'm a lancer at the Bladefoot Academy. You know, yeah. so people are like, what is that? You know, like, so, oh, so you LARP? Like, what's going on? <laughs> I mean, nothing against LARP. That's not what we do in class. It's just not. I, what we I do. LARP. I LARP for a whole summer uh, yeah. with my son and his and his buddy. Uh -huh. I'll tell you, man, those guys fought asses and elbows for four hours a day. It was bonkers. It was like the worst yeah. CrossFit class I'd ever been to. Because <laughs> you're in armor, and yeah. and I had a uh, you know they helped us make all our kit. So yeah. I have a um, somewhere I don't even know where it is. It's like a three inch foam uh, target shield yeah, and a, and a um, uh, basket hilted uh, sword that I made out of a golf club. Oh. I, it was great. It was so much fun, but I'll be damned if I wasn't just smoked after that thing. Cause yeah. those guys didn't give up. Like they were just fighting the whole time. It was, it was great. Nice. I have no, nice. I have no hate for LARPing again, yeah. more sword nerd stuff, right? Like, sure there are different kinds of sword jocks than we are. And that's, I'm totally fine with it. Yeah. I mean, ultimately throwing the magic, it. throwing the magic tennis, tennis balls at me was a little much like, yeah. When it gets to that, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm for the, for the physical contest. And not, you, me both. That's what they did. They, they said, yeah. um, okay, you're a barbarian. I'm like, I've been called that a bunch of times. So <laughs> I know. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandma always said, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, Oh, there was something I was going to go with that though. Um, ranks we were talking ranks. About. Yeah. So yeah. at Blackbird, uh, the first rank that you have is the instructor rank. So in, in Pekiti oh, Tercia, I like that. Yeah. In Pekiti Tercia, you have, um, because everything happens in threes, right? Yeah. Okay. You have, you have kind of like your first ranks, which is your, 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 um, like your, your, your literally your first three introduction ranks to the system. And then you have your second three ranks, sort of your intermediate. And then the next one is, uh, it's called Lakan Guru. It's um, sort of like associate instructor. Mm. And that's that's your your black belt. Like a Lakan okay. Guru is the first level where you can actually teach. And then Guru is, Guru, whatever you want to, however you want to anglicize it, uh, is, your, is the first 
full instructor rank. And then there's, there's other, for the most part, it becomes a like instructor of an area instructor of a region or yeah. somebody that oversees a, a big chapter of schools or whatever. And so, <clears throat> but, but yeah, anyway, the, the first rank is just an instructor rank. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's almost how I would, I would sort of recommend you do your school because that's one of the things is uh, you just have like uh, have it a junior instructor, a senior instructor, a master instructor. You know what? I like that. And I, and I like the idea of everyone should be giving back. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause that's, you know, you want this thing to go full round. Yeah, I, I'll, so I'll look into that. I'm uh, this, this what's the, what's this year? 23 this yeah, September, yeah. I'm going to be 48 years old. Okay. And you know uh, this past probably like, over the last six months or so, I've lost 40 pounds and I've Congrats. really started to take care of my fitness. And I've, I've been, I've been treating myself a lot, a heck of a lot better, you know, and I'm in a good headspace and, and all this kind of stuff. I'm trying to make some headway with the school and, you know, all these kinds of things that I've in a way kind of been putting off. And so, yeah. you know, I've kind of decided to just sort of try and make some headway. And the other weekend when we, when we went to Tipon Tipon, I was like, I'm almost 50. And I'm driving four hours to go fight strangers. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, like that's not super normal for a 25 year old, much <laughs> less the guy, much less the guy that's staring down the barrel of 50. Yeah. And I was super proud of that though. Cause like to, to keep myself in a, in a physical spot where I'm, I, I can, I can hang with these people that are, you know, half my age sometimes. Um, generally not it, Actually, to be honest, uh, at least in our school, our school skews kind of old. Probably our average student is thirty-five years old. Wow. We have a couple of people that are that are older, but um, that's pretty I, cool, actually. I mean, or a couple of people that are younger, but um, for the most part, where we skew pretty old. Yeah. Um, a bunch of our our students have belts and other stuff, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. But 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 for me personally, again, my personal journey. Um, I'm almost 50 and I'm like, how much longer do you want to do this? And it was, you know, those moments of introspection when you're, when you're just sort of sitting there drinking your coffee in the morning before you go to work and you're just thinking about the world and your place in it. And I was, I was like, it was the Friday before I was going up to the, the thing. And I was like, how much longer do you want to do this? And immediately my brain was like, as long as we can. Right. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, just like, I'll just pull back the energy. I'll just get technical. I'll just, you know, I'll always, as long as I can, I'll always do this until my, my joints won't let me, you yeah. know, because it's, I won't say it's like a central part of me, but it's, it's something I enjoy so much. And I enjoy teaching people so much that I don't want it to not be a part of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I never have ever, ever, ever thought, man, I can't wait till I'm too old to do this, <laughs> you know? And, and so like with, I think with age and birthday cake poisoning comes a certain amount of uh, introspection, right? And, and you start, you start yeah. looking at stuff a little bit different. And uh, that's kind of my thing is like, was like this weird realization that I do something as a hobby at a relatively medium to high level that not a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And I get immense pleasure out of it, even when, much like you, I hate that. I hate the hurt. I hate it so much. Yeah. But at the same time, the I'm pretty okay at it, so I don't get hurt a lot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, like <laughs> I, I really have to tangle with some guys that are pretty damn good, and then, and then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not as good as I thought. <laughs> right. Like, like some of the guys, some of the guys that I that I. Uh, play with on the regular even like from my club i get i get in tangles worse at my club than i do when i go other places yeah because our guys are pretty damn good yeah and, and yeah. that's that's my favorite part of the whole thing i'll go i'll that's go so cool and i'll play other places and i'm more worried about some of the guys that i fight with every every month because mm -hmm. they're just they're a, really a problem and it's but it's that fun like that's what keeps you coming back and that's what mm -hmm. well boy he tore my hand up. I got to start. I got to, I'm going to look at video and you're like, 
you like watch you're like oh i think i'm just not you know whatever whatever it is you're like okay i'm gonna change that and then you change it or or you don't yeah. you know i need to get faster or i need to whatever it is and i and i think that's that's part of that whole journey thing you know mm -hmm. but it but it kind of comes back to that like where do I want to be as a martial artist and, and where do I want to go and, and how do I, how do I give back and all of the things like there's, there's this really interesting philosophical part of, of being a martial arts nerd that turns into the martial arts instructor, you know, like, yeah, I, I think you're, if you're in it for long enough, you sort of realize that, that you're, you're in this really cool journey, but at the same time you can bring this really cool journey to other people. Yeah, because there's nothing like it. There's nothing like this. I've it's super weird. Regular sports. I've done rock climbing. I've done skateboarding. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've done a lot of different hobbies and phases just because I get bored easy. Mm -hmm. But I have never gotten tired of hitting people with swords and getting hit with swords. <laughs> right. Yeah. I cannot imagine the day when i'm not looking forward to the next event where i get to i get to do martial arts with weapons you know with friends yeah. and with strangers it's yeah. just so cool and it's this like you're saying it it's and and, I, and i'll say i'll say the s word it's a very spiritual type of experience yeah right yeah and uh you know because because you could play the mind games, right? Like, oh, if this was real, you would have just taken my hand. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I would have died. I would have killed you immediately. And I would right. have languished right. in the fields right. somewhere. At, you know, the, the only way that people would know that I was there is because I was screaming in agony. Yeah, and yeah. Like, delight, delight. You know, dumb stuff like that. But beyond that, it's I don't know how to to put words to it. So I won't try other than it's just... It harkens to a deep part of the human experience that I think the modern uh, environment offers less and less all the time. And it's just so primal and it's something that everybody needs to experience at least some small part of what we do. I, I think believe that to my core. I 100% I, uh, agree with you. I think... Um, I cannot remember who said it. it, it it's, it's one of the, the great philosophers. And it was like um, something to the effect that every man should see what their body is capable of. Mm. And I, I would, I would be less chauvinistic and say every person, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but um, cause there, there are certainly some, uh, some of the girls in our club that would give virtually any dude a problem. There's some tough ladies <laughs> for real. <laughs> And, and the, you know, but I think, I think you do yourself a disservice. Um, and you know, again, I'm kind of an old school guy and I'm a, I'm an old guy and I always have always thought that, um, for me and my personal journey, not, not saying what anybody else should do. I have always thought that I should take care of my family. And part of taking care of my family would be was is also being able to take care of myself, mm. in 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 especially in situations uh, physicality, right? Being able to physically take care of my family and myself in mm. in some sort of weird situation, and I, I imagine I imagine Sigmund Freud could show up and tell me exactly where where that's coming from <laughs> in my in my psyche or my or my family background or whatever, but. Um, that's always been pretty important to me. And when the, the, the huge irony is, I mean, I've always been a, a big, relatively physical guy. I wrestled heavyweight in high school. So, I mean, I'm only 20 pounds away from my high school weight right now. Oh, wow. uh, people didn't mess with me when I was a high school varsity heavyweight wrestler. They never messed with, with me after I graduated high school, never messed with me in college. And, you know, like, how, why is it such a central piece of me to only ever get better at that kind of stuff? Like I'm, I'm a gun nerd. I'm a knife nerd. I'm a sword nerd. And, and like yes. the nerd, the nerd part is always like extra, 
right? Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gun guy. I'm a knife guy. I'm a sword guy. But the nerd part is where I make the transition of not just having a whole bunch and talking about the ones that I have, but, but being somewhat of an aficionado, like knowing what I know and like trying to seek classes and education. And I, the knife that I carry, I carry for a very specific purpose and I carry a very specific one in a very specific way. I, I, the swords that I have, like I will hundred percent out myself. I have one that sits right next to my bed and it's a very specific one. It's for a very specific purpose that, that I can use a very specific way. Yeah. Right. Like that's the nerd part. But, um, the other cool thing that's happened there is I've taken uh, law enforcement combatives instructor training. I've taken uh, like pistol shooting classes. I've taken like, like I've sought education in all these things that like the amount of money that I've done, I've spent on training is stupid <laughs> and I don't make a dime. Like the, the Blackbird training group is not my school. The, the Black Feather Broadsword Academy, um, I I don't take a dime. Like all, in, in fact, I probably just hemorrhage money. Like I buy, <laughs> I buy patches, I buy stickers, I do. Yep. Like some people pay me p for some of that stuff. But like for the most part, I just want the school to be successful. I want everybody to learn the stuff. I want everybody engaged. And I imagine, you know, at some point it'd be really cool if I get a return on my investment. <laughs> but yeah you sometimes know, the, i'm jealous of karate dojos because they just have to show right? up in a gi and that's yeah. it you know i and, just and a box a uh, uh, you know punching bags that's it yeah like we do um we teach a women's self-defense class <clears throat> and we're gonna try and ramp this up we've done we've done quite a number of them so far and they've been relatively informal kind of here and there not not regular you know yeah. when are you gonna do your next one and it's like oh i don't know three months or whatever we're going to try and get to a schedule. But our version of women's self-defense is you have a weapon, right? Like if mm -hmm. in a knife, if you can, right? Like mm -hmm. figure out what you, what you're willing to fight for. And then, and then when it's time to fight, you fight tooth and toenail. Right. And, yeah. and, and here's this very quickly accessible piece of how to, how to defend yourself with a knife. That is super important to me because one of the things that I've learned, you're, you're kind of a bigger guy. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I've learned as an instructor, the two hardest people to teach that it's okay to spar at a high level to are women and big guys. Women always hear, be careful. That's not ladylike. Yeah. And big guys always hear, be careful. You're bigger than they are. You could hurt them. Yep. Right. How many times you hear that? Yep. If your mama trained you right, that's exactly that echoes in your head when you're a big dude. Right. And so, so one of the things like, um, when you're talking about women's self-defense, one of the statistics that comes out of the FBI is the harder and the longer, uh, duration of, uh, resistance by the victim, the shorter, the overall duration of the event. So the more a woman fights back and the longer that she fights back for, the shorter the overall engagement of that event's going to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does it. It does make sense. And it's also very encouraging. Yeah. So um, teaching them that it's okay to fight back at all, at all, will shorten the length of the event. Hmm. And so, you know, teaching people that it's okay giving them that permission. One of the first things that, that Lamont wanted to uh, instill in this class, and I thought it was a brilliant move, was there's a little bit of talking at the, at the very first to kind of set the stage. And one of the things that he talks about uh, is, uh, or while well, we talk about now, is um, know the reason you're going to fight. Right? Like, if it's a mom, dude, that's like, that's the low hanging fruit, your children. Right. But for uh, single, uh, single people or people with no kids or whatever, it's like your personal sovereignty or, or whatever, like, don't touch me. You know, you, you should be fighting with sort of a righteous indignation. Like, how dare you, sir? 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> but, 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 but like take it to that next level. Like, like where does that stop? And what, what the problem is, um, there's also like, you know, more and more statistics about this kind of stuff. Um, but there's some statistic that I can't remember the numbers for, uh, a huge proportion of women did not fight initially. So they started getting assaulted and they did not fight initially. And then, then there was some line was crossed and then they fought. And yeah. that's part of it. Like teaching, teaching these women that there's, there's a line that it's okay. Like, right. Like when it gets to this point, it's time to fight. Like whatever that looks like, whatever that is for you, again, personal journey. Right. Mm -hmm. But for me, that's another one of those things. Um, we only charge for a, for a three hour, three or four hour class. We only charge 20 bucks. Oh, wow. Right. And it's, it's a, it, and then really that's just so we can make rent because mm -hmm. we don't have quite, we have barely enough people to, that's in the class month to month to make the rent that we need to make. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, when, when we do, we did a, this kind of class, you know, what we, we did with this, we bought a bunch of sticks because we were getting low on sticks. Sticks are disposable. Yeah. Uh, so we, we bought a bunch of sticks and then we bought a banner for a men's expo that we're doing some demos at Very like cool. everything goes straight back into the school. Quick question for you. Where do you source your sticks from? Frank's rattan. Frank's rattan. Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, where I get them is they're good. It's just, they're more expensive than I want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Frank's rattan, we get, Frank, we Frank get fast for you, buddy. <laughs> we get uh, <laughs> boxes of 26, uh, okay. for, they end up being hovering around 10 bucks a pair. A pair. Yeah. Wow. That's really good. It's like $4 and $4 and 65 cents a stick or something like that. Oh, something that's like. way better than what yeah. I pay. And there, and so we get the, we get one inch by 30 inch. Mm -hmm. Those are the, those are the sticks links that we get. You can yeah. get, you can get a box of the single stick sticks, the 36 inch sticks. Yeah. And those are closer to seven or eight bucks or something. Still, but that's really it's, good. yeah, you should check them out. They're, and we, their, their system is really interesting. Their website is circa 1978, right? <laughs> right after Al Gore invented the internet, uh, Frank <laughs> the website. Yeah. So you, you order it, you click add to cart, you click checkout, you get an email that says, we will call you. Oh, to wow. confirm your your uh, credit card info, right. and uh, for me, what happened recently was I got a thing on my PayPal app requesting payment, and I just paid it, and I they shipped it within a couple of days. Okay, so I think they've kind of updated their technology, but we used to literally we would literally check out, and then they would call us the next day, and we would give them our credit card number. We did that for years. Yeah, oh, wow. we've used Frank's Rattan for ten years, probably. Franks for tan. Yeah, uh, no, we've that, even got like yeah. sea bots, like an uh, inch and a quarter. Well, sea bot is a Filipino short spear, like five yeah. foot tall spear. Uh -huh. So we have like inch and a half, quarter to inch and a half, like heavy duty rattan, like big kid stuff. Yeah, and we got that from them too. So nice. we we get all sorts of crap from them. Yeah, I'll have to give them a shot because the the other ones that I got, you know, they they have the dowel on the one end and they've drilled it and they've glued it in all nice. But hey, look, I got I got a drill. I know where to get dowels. Yeah, <laughs> it's worth seven. Yeah, you know, the the extra. Yeah, savings. That's interesting. I'll have to see yeah. what you're talking about because that's the the dowel. Well, yeah, thing. yeah. Because if you're gonna put on the, um, you know, the hand protection, um, and they they're supposed to so like when you thrust, they're supposed to slide up, but then at the uh, very bottom they stay somehow, and, and so oh, how, yeah. how they do it is is there's just a little hole drilled in it with like a dowel running this way, so perpendicular to the stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it can only go so far, but you could do tape, you could do whatever. So yeah, we we do tape on our single sticks. Yeah, that's probably the easiest way to do it. You mean the ghettoist way, or the or the the pragmatic way? I mean, sure. If you want to be funny and use a big word. I just, <laughs> I'm just kind of I dirt bag it, you know. Yeah, right, right, right. No, but you guys have some really cool ideas how you just shoestring stuff, and it totally works, amazing. Mm -hmm. And who cares? I mean, it's it's just it's just a tool. Yeah, you know. I mean, because for for me, 
the the weapon is here. Yep. Everything else is just a tool. It's just how you how you get you. there. Yeah, right. And so, um, you know, you're using sticks and pretending it's a sword for crying out loud. So yeah, I mean, right. this is your weapon, right? Did, so whatever you, ever... you do to that stick for your training purpose, that's it, it just is yeah. what it is. Did did we ever show you the focus mitt things we made? Because we showed you the rubber dog ball. That uh, was a genius, the rubber dog ball, yeah. So so there's a different rubber dog ball by that same company, and it's a ball that has a hole goes all the way through the middle. Uh-huh. And the way it comes from Amazon is a big rope through the middle. Oh. Well, if you cut that rope off and you put a heavy uh, rattan stick in there, yes, it, it becomes like a rubber mace. Yeah. But what we use it for is a focus mitt. Yeah. So like you and I will be moving around the the practice floor and uh-huh. then every time I extend my hand, that's you seeing an opportunity. And you hit it. So then God. like if you're practicing hand jabs, so we're moving around and I stick it out and it, like it roughly where a hand level would be, you like bap that you're getting your reaction time, your your you know, that OODA loop, right? Or observe, orient, decide, act. Yeah. So you're like, okay, I see the hand there, I attack it, boom, I got it. Well, or we're going to do thrusts. And so we're moving around and then I, I put the stick out like it's my face and you have to like move and thrust and or what, like whatever it. thrust we're working on I like that because it's only, you know, it's only six or eight inches around. Mm-hmm. So it, it constrains you to be relatively accurate yeah. on a moving target while you're moving, you know, and I, I think it's a, it's a super brilliant uh, training modality. It was a total accident. We thought we were buying the other ones to make more single sticks. <laughs> and then we're like, uh, I know <laughs> a couple of Genius. our guys, a couple of our guys have tried to hit each other with it and they're even heavier than everything else. They're, oh, wow. they're pretty brutal. So we don't do that anymore. Yeah. You could probably giant, giant what the giant cudgel. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It'd be a good time had by all, I imagine. If you're the cudgel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> mm, hit, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Shoot, man, we've been at this for a very long time. I told you I talk too much. No, it's great. I, I, I love it. And, and uh, I hope the audience enjoys it as, as much as I have. Yeah, me too. Um, but. I'm not sure about your situation, but I got work tomorrow morning. I, I got me both. I got to be up at uh, 3:45. Oh, geez, man. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, before we go, is there anything else that that we need to know, um, about the upcoming, um, see, it's so late, I can't even think here. This the is Sagebrush Skirmish. Totally bad radio. Yeah. Thank you. The Sagebrush Skirmish. What do we need to know about it? So you drive in there from far away. Where do people stay? What's what's uh, some 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 cool um, magic as far so as the, that goes? The, the the town where it's outside of is the town of or the city of Prosser. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am not a hundred percent savvy on on Prosser. Uh, the Tri Cities is kind of the next bigger the next biggest town, and it's significantly larger. Um, I imagine Prosser probably has some Airbnbs or some uh, uh, hotels and stuff there. I, I have a friend that lives there and. And whatnot. She's it's kind of any small town USA kind of thing. The Tri Cities yeah. has like a you know Hampton Inn and Red Lion and you know all the things. So uh, probably a little bit more accessible in a way. It, it like plus oh I have to tell you I I don't know if I told you yet but one of the things that we're planning is the tournament is on Saturday. Yeah. On Sunday we have we're having a barbecue. The eats yes. So um, we're going to have an option. Yes, we're going to have an option on the sign in thing, which I'll get you a link to as soon as I have a one made up. Um, We're working on a Google sheet kind of a thing. Nice. uh, That we'll be sending out. Um, But on the sheet will be, uh, will you attend this barbecue? Are you going to have uh, plus ones or plus mores? (laughs) And then uh, will you be bringing food or money? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, I like so if it. you're if you're bringing sides or if you're bringing whatever you know that that's awesome and we super encourage that if you are bringing uh cash money um my wife and i are gonna okay i'll be totally honest probably yeah. mostly my wife because i'll be i'll be sword fighting 
Right. Um, she's an amazing, amazing cook and runs a barbecue like like nobody's business. So um, she, we're going to be like doing some smoked meats and barbecue kind of stuff for that. So nice. Um, we'll c- try and provide most of the protein. Uh, people want to bring other stuff too. I'm not going to ever say no, but cool. uh, so that's so going to be Sunday. Gotcha. And I'm work. I'm, I'm also working on uh, trying to get one of the local hotels to maybe cut us a deal on a on a block of rooms, but Ooh, that's nice. super tentative right now. Yeah, gotcha. So, so is, circling back to the the money for food, what's the suggested um, um, the, donation? Uh, I yeah, think donation, donation is probably a good place. Uh, a good I, I imagine. I I think we have it written on the thing, but I think it's around twenty bucks, something yeah, like that. Totally reasonable. Which, you know, like you know, fifteen twenty bucks or whatever. I I don't want to I don't want to put people out, but at the same time, right now you go it's to any barbecue. restaurant. I was going to say you go to any restaurant right now, twenty bucks. If you're not bringing food, twenty bucks is going to buy you dinner. Right. So, yeah. I, no, I think I, that's I think totally that's reasonable. Pretty, yeah. Uh, I don't know. So thinking about other other uh, housekeeping things, I can't remember how much we've decided on the event itself. But I know we're going to have um, we don't want to do sh- T-shirts. T-shirts seem sort of uh, everybody gets a T-shirt. I think we're going to do embroidered patches. Everybody oh, will be get, sick. Everybody will get an embroidered patch. Yeah. Uh, uh, what else we're going to do? We're going to try and do prizes for first, second and third. Um, we are currently in search of sponsors. If anybody wants to sponsor, uh, us, I'm not sure. Um, I think we're, we're maybe one of the things we're thinking about is anybody that sponsors us, will put their name on a two foot by four foot banner and hang it at the event. But, uh, I'm not sure, um, mm-hmm. what else that looks like. However else we're going to advertise that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're going to try and do a prize for first, second, and third in both tournaments. Uh, like I said, the guy that or the person that uh, places first in single stick gets an invite to the sword and buckler tournament. Uh, if they don't have good kit, uh, appropriate kit, we will kit them out with uh, the ridiculous amount of kit that we have. <laughs> um, kit for sword and buckler is a serviceable buckler. Uh, bring what you bring as far as a sword. And there's going to be a length limitation that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, gloves, forearms, hard elbows, hard knees and lower legs, gamison and mask back ahead in a gorget is a, a sword and buckler requirement. The stick, single stick requirement is far less. It is, if I remember correctly, it's like uh, knees and elbows, gloves and a mask. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure there's no gamison requirement. There's no gorget requirement. Don't quote me on that, though. I'm the for the people that are going to be in the tournament. We'll have full access to requirements and rule sets and all that as soon as yeah. we can. We're and still I'm, finalizing all that. And I'm linking your Facebook event um, in yeah. the show cool. notes. So if it's updated there, then if they follow yes. this podcast in the show notes, it should be down there. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And then you know, for like I said, for the barbecue, um, we're going to have the the space that we that we rent. We're going to have that for the day. And so bring what you bring. If you're a longsword guy, I can 200% guarantee you we will have people for you to fight. If you're a uh, pocket knife guy, I 400% guarantee you're going to have people to fight. <laughs> um, uh, I have been known to pull the odd airsoft gun on people during sparring. Uh, <laughs> but that's 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 more of the T-bone, T-bone thing than the HEMA. <laughs> Um, trying to think of what else. I think that's kind of it. Like cool. the, the tri cities is also known as a, a, a big and, and Prosser specifically too. That it's a, it's wine country, like died, died in the wool, probably better than California, even though California wow. won't admit it. So, um, <laughs> if you, if you take, you know, take the weekend and come down and, and stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool area. Yeah. And it's father's day weekend. So dad's, there you go. You need to do. Yep. You know, clout time. And yeah, all, you, all you have to say is, out here. all I want to do is go fight people. And, uh, you know, what are, what are they going to say? Yeah. I'd rather you I'd rather you stay home and crochet. Like, maybe if that's your thing, that's cool. But <laughs> I thought you were going to hit me today, dear. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that doesn't have no. the same traction. Yeah, no. Well, if she has a mask and sticks and, you know, 
Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, Monica and Jay, oh, like, yeah. like the couple that 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 swing swords together stays together. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, power couple there. <laughs> For real. I, I'd love to see how they're how they um settle household spats. Oh <laughs> They've man, got their gear all ready to go to the pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so great. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, hey, man, it's been great talking to you. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. Everybody, Jim Epperly. So, um, yeah, look him up. Um, If you're in the area and you're looking for some martial arts experience, definitely check out his club. And, again, I got show notes in the the, bottom of the – I got the notes in the show notes, so there's (laughs) links there. Uh, And I think I got your martial art club um, listed as well. So Right on. Cool. All right, I'm going to end the recording now. Everybody, remember to slay your demons, and we'll catch you on the next one.